Uh, good morning and welcome to the 23rd meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2017. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones and as members, members papers are provided in a digital format, tablets might be used by some members during the meeting. Uh, we're not quite all here yet but no apologies have been received so hopefully we'll have a full house of MSPs here shortly and we move to agenda item one which is building regulations and fire safety in Scotland. The committee will take evidence on its scrutiny of building regulations and fire safety in Scotland and can I welcome Kevin Stewart, Minister for Local Government and Housing. Uh, good morning Minister. Good morning. Uh, Bill Dodds, Head of Building Standards Scottish Government and Dave McGowan, Assistant Chief Officer Scottish Fire and Rescue. Uh, good morning gentlemen. Uh, thank you all of you for joining us th this morning. Uh, Minister, I uh, understand there's an opening statement that you'd, you'd like to make to the committee and we'll, we'll be keen to hear that now, thanks. Uh, please, Convener, and thank you. Uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk to the committee about the steps taken by the Scottish Government to ensure that building regulations and fire safety are robust. Uh, this work has added urgency following the tragic events at Grenfell Tower uh, and my thoughts and deepest sympathies are with all of those affected by that tragedy. Uh, in the days following the Grenfell fire, the Scottish Government took immediate proactive steps to establish a ministerial working group on building and fire safety. Uh, this was set up with the primary aim of offering public reassurance and ensuring any action that we needed to take as a result of what we know or will find out uh, about the Grenfell Tower fire. Uh, the work of the group has been twofold, Convener. Our first focus was to respond proactively and immediately to offer public reassurance of the fire safety of high-rise buildings, in particular high-rise domestic buildings. The nature and the scale of the work has been resource intensive and I want to express my gratitude to local authorities, housing associations and the other organisations involved for their responsiveness to our requests. This helped the Ministerial Working Group establish very quickly the extent of the use of ACM in high-rise buildings. I also want to record my thanks to the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service for the steps they immediately took to prior prioritise home fire safety visits in domestic high-rise properties. Over 1,200 visits have taken place and everyone who has requested a home fire safety visit has received one. Uh, inspections of high-rise residential buildings have also uh, carried on with almost 900 carried out since Grenfell. 60,000 fire safety leaflets have also been distributed, providing reassurance to residents. The Ministerial Working Group is conscious, however, that reassurance to the public on fire safety must be ongoing. So we've commissioned a targeted national fire safety campaign for high-rise domestic buildings, which will launch shortly, focusing on key messages including fire safety, evacuation uh, and stay put procedures. The second focus of the group has been on a wider range of measures to enhance and strengthen building regulations, enforcement and compliance, as well as fire safety. Uh, today, I'm able to inform the committee uh, that I've appointed two established leaders in their field of expertise to chair the two groups that will take forward the review of building standards. Professor John Cole, Cole will chair the review of enforcement and compliance, uh, and Dr Paul Stollard will chair the review of fire safety and building standards. I'm delighted that we are so fortunate to have two chairs of such a uh, high calibre leading this work. While Scottish building regulations from 2005 prevent the cladding of high-rise domestic buildings in the same type of ACM found on Grenfell, Ministers are very aware that whilst this cladding was clearly a major contributing factor to the rapid spread of the fire, it may not be the only one. Uh, we will therefore be ready to respond to any relevant findings or recommendations uh, that emerge from the Grenfell Public Inquiry and our work programme will remain flexible to allow us to take any appropriate actions. While it was important to understand what buildings have ACM on them, it's equally important to understand that the presence of ACM cladding by itself does not necessarily mean that a building is defective or dangerous. 
It is the extent of use of ACM uh, as part of the overall cladding system that forms part of the ju judgment of the safety of the building. It is that information we sought to collate. We quickly gathered information from all local authorities that no social high-rise buildings were clad in ACM. We then gained clarity from 31 local authorities that no ACM was found on building warrant applications of pri private domestic high-rise buildings. Uh, Glasgow City Council reported the presence of ACM on some private high-rise properties. We offered Glasgow assistance to further interrogate the information they hold, and they have now accepted that offer. We expect them to establish soon the extent, the exact number of buildings with ACM, the type of ACM, and the extent of its use as part of a cladding system. From this convener, we expect Glasgow to provide the same information we have received from other local authorities. As you rightly noted during your last evidence session, Glasgow City Council have a responsibility to those residents to progress this work as a matter of urgency. I hope that this brief overview of what is a very complicated issue is of use and that you recognise the Ministerial Working Group is taking all of this very seriously. Our work programme covers a number of important streams of work and we have put mechanisms in place to ensure we are able to take action as needed and when needed. Thank you, Convener. Um, thank you very much, Minister, uh, for, for that a detailed opening statement. Uh, you'll appreciate, um, just given the nature of the committee last week, that members will want to start by discussing the Glasgow situation in the first instance, but I'm also conscious that we're doing a wider inquiry here, so for a while we would intend asking some very specific questions about Glasgow and then move on to, to, to some wider issues. So uh, I think it's reasonable to, to ask your, your views, Minister, in, in the first instance. Um, the way that members of the public, that this committee discovered that there were issues in Glasgow was wholly inappropriate. Uh, the communication to this committee and indirectly to to the wider public was, was, was done in such a way that it's potentially caused additional fear and alarm that was perhaps not necessary. Do you think that's something the local authorities should be re reflecting on and remedying as soon as possible? Well, I'm very disappointed in some of the things that were said last week, Convener. Um, the, minister, the Ministerial Working Group uh, received information from the Chief uh, Building Standards Officer, uh, Mr Dodds, regarding um, the, uh, the information that Glasgow had uh, provided the, the Working Group. Uh, we were unhappy um, at the detail or lack of detail um, that uh, we received. Uh, and uh, as I've said, we received full details from other local authorities, convener. And Mr. Dodds um, has asked uh, for uh, that information to be interrogated further uh, and for uh, the information that we require uh, to, to come to us. Um, we also, um, as the committee are probably aware, um, have offered Glasgow help along the way. Um, we recognise that um, Edinburgh and Glasgow, as bigger cities, had more work to do than some other authorities. Um, Edinburgh accepted that help um, and had received somewhere in the region of about 150 person hours uh, to help them uh, deal with the information uh, that we required. Glasgow refused that help and it was not until uh, the council leader instructed um, uh, the officers there uh, that they have finally taken that help uh, and we moved uh, folk in there yesterday. The key thing in all of this convener is getting the right information um, and you're right, um, not having the right uh, information can cause alarm out there uh, and that is why it's so important that we have the right information before we take the next steps. Um, beyond that convener, I, I was particularly disappointed um, at uh, some of the answers um, that were given to the Deputy Convener's line of questioning uh, on this issue. Um, because uh, Ms Smith rightly asked questions uh, around about responsibility. Um, and the response from the witness was, uh, in terms of legislative powers, 
there's not much that local authorities can do other than notify people. That is extremely disappointing, convener, because there is a, a number of powers. Glasgow City Council are responsible uh, for uh, the verification and the enforcement uh, of building standards. And if they feel um, that there is a danger out there, they have the ability to act either if the owner does not do the work themselves. The local authority can do that work and then recoup costs later. But I would expect um, uh, people uh, to know the full extent of the powers that they have under the Building Standards Act 2003. Um, and I aim uh, to ensure that all uh, building standards uh, officers um, uh, know what their responsibilities are in this regard. I would expect that the vast bulk of them do anyway, uh, but I will be taking steps to write to all local authorities around about this so that they know exactly what their responsibilities are in that regard. That's helpful, Minister. Yes, it was staggering that the Assistant Head of Planning and Building Standards at Glasgow City Council wouldn't know what uh, his statutory powers uh, were in relation to building standards and enforcement. Um, I know your letter of the 20th of September outlines that to the committee as well. Um, but we want to kind of move on uh, to reassure people in Glasgow and right across the country, of course. And one of the things you mentioned, Minister, was a lack of clarity in the information Glasgow had given the, the, the ministerial working group. Now, I'm assuming that lack of clarity wasn't an issue for Edinburgh. They, they, sought, they, they sought support, they were offered support, uh, records were interrogated. What kind of lack of clarity have have you had from Glasgow? What is it they've not, they've, they've not done well enough? I'll take Mr Dodds in to, to give you the, the lack of clarity because some of this is detailed and technical, as you're very well aware, sure. convener, in terms uh, of the briefings that you have had yourselves previously. Um, but what I would say is, out of the 32 local authorities, 18 of them have high-rise buildings. 18 responded very quickly, um, did not have a difficulty uh, in terms of putting together the information that we asked for. Um, as I said previously, convener, uh, we recognise that there may be more work for Glasgow and Edinburgh, uh, and that is why uh, we offered the support that we did. Um, Edinburgh took up that offer of support. Um, Glasgow uh, did not. Um, they now have that support in. Um, we have uh, an email from Glasgow, uh, which we received, which my officials received at 8.16 this morning, uh, which says that they are on track to complete the necessary work uh, by the end of this week. Um, and, you know, I will be keeping a close tab uh, to make sure that that work is completed as soon as it possibly can be. Because you're absolutely right, convener, uh, we need to take any actions necessary um, uh, coming from the completed information uh, that we receive. But in terms of the detail of what has been asked, I would pass on to Mr Do Dodds, if you don't mind, convener. Of course, Mr Dodds, yes. Uh, good morning, convener. Good morning. Yes, it's mainly clarity around the extent of, of the cladding. You know, for example, in many high-rise buildings can have a combination of different cladding types, whether it's render or rain screen cladding or ACM. So the majority of the requests for clarity are around the, the, probably the age of the building, the, the height of the building, the extent of the cladding material, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, some of the, the, the descriptions that were given to us were two floors, a penthouse flat or, or whatever. So it, it was a clarity around the extent. And I think it's, it's quite important to, to clarify that in, Gre in Grenfell, the entire building was overclad uh, with uh, the ACM material. So it was a complete enclosure of ACM material. Um, so what we're trying to do is establish whether we have a Grenfell type arrangement where the building is completely overclad and an ACM product, or whether it's in isolated areas, um, you know. So that's the clarity we're asking. There were also some questions around plan retrieval and looking at, uh, you know, um, on the ground 
inspections and clarifying whether some of the information was absolutely uh, as it should have been. So that, that request has gone back almost line by line now, asking for that additional clarity, and we've been given a reassurance that we'll get that clarity, uh, hopefully by the end of this week. I suppose the obvious question to ask is why Glasgow would put a return in that lacked that clarity in the first place. I can guess there's, there's two potential reasons for that. One is they didn't know what was expected of them, so I'd be asking why Glasgow didn't know what was expected of them, but other local authorities did know what was expected of them. Or secondly, their, their record keeping over a number of years in relation to building warrants is just perhaps not up to scratch. I think, Convener, you know, as you rightly point out, other local authorities managed to undertake this exercise quite quickly. Um, Edinburgh with that additional help. Um, and it is very disappointing that Glasgow has not managed uh, to do exactly uh, the same thing. Uh, I will hand over to Mr Dodds in terms of record keeping. Um, what I would say um, to you, convener, um, and the committee may already be aware of this, um, but in terms of the verification, um, the, uh, my uh, responsibility in terms of appointing verifiers, uh, recently, uh, that reappointment took place um, and uh, a number of local authorities who were performing well got the maximum six years um, of verification. Uh, those who were average got three and three local authorities who I thought were performing poorly or not as well as they should be, um, that's Glasgow, Edinburgh and Stirling, uh, got one year. Uh, beyond that, we agreed that we would audit um, these local authorities in November to make sure that all of the things that were, they were doing were up to scratch, which would include record keeping. But on uh, the, the details of record keeping issues, I'll pass to Mr Dodds. Okay, thank you, Minister. Yes, uh, it's, it's safe to say that the information that we gave out to all authorities was equally consistent, you know, and we had, uh, we met with Edinburgh officials quite early on, middle of July, went through the process of establishing what ACM should be. There was a number of requests to Glasgow to have meetings, but um, obviously what happened there was summer holidays intervened and so on and so forth. So there were a number of phone calls as well where it was explained the position that we were we were in, what the information we were looking for was to establish that uh, information. I believe in Glasgow there were some difficulties in retrieving documents from archives and so on and so forth. Um, and yes, and I know that Glasgow have been going through uh, some some issues with IT. They've changed their IT system and so on. And so on. But uh, it's something that we will certainly look at during the audit process, the record keeping within Glasgow to make sure that the type of information that is being retrieved. And the two surveyors that we have in there just now will be working through those records and um, no doubt we'll get some feedback from them uh, and to establish exactly what the issue was in retrieving the information. So could there be a, dare I say, a positive legacy for Glasgow? Will the Scottish Government work with the local authority to provide support in relation not just to making sure the record keeping is spot on, but the, the retrieval of that information can be done speedily and effectively to, to reassure, but also to make sure that the, the information that are put on building warrants and related documentation is as it should be as well. So rather than just assure ourselves that um, Glasgow has got all this information accurate as of Friday in relation to informing uh, owners and residents in, in these properties, in six months or one year or two years, we may have to go through this whole process again to interrogate building warrants for another reason. Hopefully not a disaster on the scale of Grenfell, but we have to reassure ourselves that products used in, in the construction phase of any development was was, 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 the, was the correct material. So will lessons be learned? Not just Glasgow, there's 32 local authorities out there. Others seem to have moved much more speedily and, and, and successfully on this, but... Is there lessons to be learned for local <coughs> authorities and how speedily and quickly we can pull out the required information off the building warrant system? Convener, um, you know, prior um, to the situation um, at Grenfell, I had to make the decision around about that appointment of verifiers 
So the decisions about audit and all of the rest um, came before um, the situation. Uh, but um, it now become, becomes more apparent, I would say, that certain local authorities require um, help and the expert help that we can provide. Now, I've been very clear, as had Mr Dodds um, throughout, um, that if local authorities feel that they need a hand from my officials, um, some expert advice um, to ensure that the exporting of good practice is taking place, then that will happen and can happen. The disappointing thing, and Mr Dodds has been a little bit diplomatic, is that Glasgow refused to meet with officials around about this. They did not seek uh, a meeting, and we can be we can be nice about holidays and all of the rest of it, um, but you know they had the same opportunity as, as others and didn't take it. The other disappointing thing, and I cannot reiterate this enough, convener, is the fact that they refused help when it was offered, and it took the intervention of the council leader to get building standards officers in Glasgow to accept that help. Um, that, to me, is unacceptable, convener. Um, I think you've got nodding heads from committee members here. We, we also believe it's unacceptable not to take the required expertise and support when it's such a priority to protect public safety in residential properties in, in Glasgow. One final question for myself, then, I want to let the deputy convener in to explore other lines of questioning. Um, much was made of the fact that fire and rescue in Glasgow were unaware of this situation. Now, we've got Mr McGowan here today. Uh, Scottish Fire and Rescue sit on the Ministerial Working Group. Um, in terms of lines of communication, yes, I absolutely believe that Glasgow City Council should have uh, immediately told uh, uh, Fire and Rescue in Glasgow, but Scottish Fire and Rescue were in the Ministerial Working Group. It was not out with the realms of possibility that Scottish Fire and Rescue couldn't pick up the phone and speak to the team in Glasgow. So just in terms of future-proofing all of this, on reflection, was there maybe more that could have been done at the ministerial working group level to notify uh, fire and rescue within Glasgow? I think, Convener, um, you know, as you rightly say, the uh, fire service serve on the ministerial uh, working group, which is it's very important that we have their input. Um, in terms of inspections uh, and the rest that have happened, um, I'll hand over to Mr McGowan, uh, because although uh, that information did not come from Glasgow to the Fire and Rescue Service, he will be able to tell you um, the level of inspection uh, that has taken place uh, in Glasgow, um, uh, not just since, but over, over the course of, of all of this. Mr yeah. McGowan. Thank, thank you. Um, just in terms of the point regarding the information that was passed to our local uh, crews in Glasgow, the information that we received as part of the Ministerial Working Group on the 8th of September um, was unclear. So any information that we get which is definitive about any risk within any premise is passed directly to our local crews who clearly must know the information about the risks within their particular area. Um, as soon as we received more substantial information, albeit incomplete, those were passed to our local crews straight away, who at the same time were in dialogue with Glasgow um, City Council. But in terms of the, um, the buildings that were found by Glasgow City Council and the information that was eventually passed to the Ministerial Working Group, there were 57 uh, properties. 42 of those properties have actually already been uh, visited by operational crews as part of the standard quarterly inspection programme that our operational crews conduct across the whole of Scotland. And those 42 visits actually occurred since Grenfell. So since that tragic incident, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service um, concentrated their programme of inspections, which, as I say, is a regular programme throughout Scotland anyway. But we thought it right to, to conduct a, a, a concerted and concentrated programme of, of inspections. Those 42 were on the radar, they were on the records of local crews in Glasgow. The other 15 are getting complete as we speak today. So we're hopeful by uh, this time next week that those inspections will be complete by our local crews on the ground. Okay, that's very helpful. I think it's also useful to say at that point, convener, that uh, in terms of the remaining 15, 
it would be the norm that every building over 18 metres would be reported to the fire service um, and that routine inspections would take place. Those 15s are not on the routine list, is my understanding. But I'll hand back to Mr McGowan on that and then come back in, convener. Sure. Yeah. Um, thank you. Simply because the information that we received from Glasgow City Council was rather incomplete um, and it wasn't definitive, definitive enough to say whether the buildings were, were even all high-rise premises, which obviously are those premises that we concentrate our inspection um, programme on. Regardless of whether they are or not, we're making it a point to actually visit those 15 premises, even if they are what we class to be medium or low-rise. If they are indeed high-rise for our inspection purposes, we'll include those as part of our ongoing inspection programme um, within Glasgow. But it was unfortunate we didn't have clear and definitive enough information following the last ministerial working group um, to get out there straight away until we received that information last week from, uh, from the City Council. Okay, thank you. Now I've got other members of the committee wanting to come in. Uh, Minister, you, you mentioned where Deputy Convener's line of questioning last week. I don't know if she's keen to follow up on some of that. Ellie Smith, MSP. Thanks very much, Convener, and thanks for coming this morning, Minister. Yes, I think in my line of questioning last week, we had limited time, but um, I was trying to, to ask the Council why they didn't act immediately then with the information that they had. And it seems then to me that um, they may not have had that information in the first place if the Ministerial Working Group hadn't been set up and asked for the, the information to be forthcoming. But once they got that information, I think questions are still outstanding then and why why they didn't take the offer of help. That, that has to be resolved as to why that was the case. And also um, why they didn't then act immediately on the information. But one of the answers that Mr Barlow gave last week, and it was actually to the convener, was that um, they obviously felt that in passing over the information they had, that that was enough at that point for Fire and Rescue to know about it. Because what he said on the record was, um, therefore, the fire service at the highest national level in Scotland will be party to the information we have provided. So there seems to be some kind of communication breakdown. I did mention the word red tape, which Mr Barlow didn't seem to take kindly to last week, but what I meant by that was why delay? So I just wondered if you're in a position to give us any kind of answer to that. I know that the council have now instructed that, that Glasgow City Council take the assistance, but what we saw last week was there was information there. Glasgow City Council clearly felt that they had done their bit, if, they, if you like, in passing it to the Ministerial Working Group. They went further than that in saying the Fire and Rescue clearly knew about it because of that, and therefore there was a gap. So I wonder if you could maybe comment any further on that, because I don't think I got a clear answer as to why they didn't take immediate action. I don't think that you got a clear <laughs> answer either, um, convener. Can I take uh, Mr Dodds in on the technicals first, and then I'll cover the rest of it, please, convener, if that's OK? Of course, Mr Dodds. OK. Um and the first point about the, the, the assistance, I, I think Glasgow City Building Control believed that they had the requisite number of staff and qualifications to be able to undertake that assessment to collate the information. That was their, that was their assessment. We asked a number of times whether they wanted assistance and were given reassurances that the information was forthcoming. It didn't come through as quickly as other authorities. and. We had more dialogue with other authorities, that's, that's safe to say as well. Um, and the second point, but why didn't they act on the information? I guess that's something that you probably need to speak to Glasgow about specifically again, and I think it's something that we would want to take up. You know, And again, my, my sense on it is that the level of information, the detail of the information, um, it would be incorrect to act uh, on limited information and set here running. So before they had that... Limited information, it would be incorrect to act by the ministerial group, do you mean, or by no, the no, City Council? Glasgow City Council, I think, uh, if, if my interpretation of what was being said last week is correct, is, is that they, they were collecting this information... Um, it, was, it wasn't full information that they had at the time, and therefore, um, to, to act on that limited information, they were, they were having a reluctance in doing that. And, and again, I think what came over in the meeting was that they were, they, 
they thought that their undertaking was simply to supply the Ministerial Working Group with the information and that thereafter the Ministerial Working Group would be responsible for doing something with that. Whereas in the past, what has been happening with the Ministerial Working Group is that the information has been getting fed back, for example, within, with the school's estate and so on and so forth. And, and, and when it's been found, the actions that have been getting taken by the, the local authority have, have, have then went on to expand on now that you've found this material, the information you've got, what are you doing with it? And then there, thereafter, the reassurances were given to the Ministerial Working Group. But ultimately, it's the building owner that's responsible for their own buildings. And I think at the time that the, the last committee meeting, the information was just had just come to hand. And uh, my understanding is because of the limited nature of that information, that, um, that Glasgow were looking for guidance on what they would, were going to do with it. Convener, I think there is a, a very important uh, strand here, and that's about responsibility uh, and who is responsible for what. And as Mr Dodds has rightly pointed out, um, the building owner is ultimately responsible for compliance. However, the Building Standards Act 2003 uh, says quite clearly that Glasgow has the responsibility for the verification and enforcement. And if at any point um, Mr uh, Barlow or his team felt that there were dangers, then they should have taken enforcement action. Um, the only way um, that the Ministerial Working Group um, could take any enforcement action would be if uh, I use powers under the 2003 Act, uh, removing enforcement powers from a local authority and directing those enforcement powers myself. Now, if I thought that was a necessary step to uh, ensure safety, uh, then I would do so. Um, Glasgow, uh, in a press release last week, said that they were confident that these buildings were safe. I take it that that's the judgment of Mr Barlow and his building standards team before that went out. Um, however, you know, we still need to get all of the information that is required to see what needs to be done. But we um, ourselves, in terms of the Fire and Rescue Service and in terms uh, of Mr Dodds, at every point have offered um, the help uh, that is required. Uh, we have uh, uh, dealt with our responsibilities. Um, and that part, the part of your questioning last week uh, and the responses uh, to your questions, Deputy Convener, uh, was the, the part of all of this that disturbed me the most and the fact that there, was, there seemed to be a, a lack of understanding about the uh, responsibilities under the Building Standards Scotland Act 2003. And if I might convene it, I think what I would probably want assurance on is that if any local authority did find something that was of concern, then that they would act immediately in the future. I think that's what we would need to know. I, I would expect any local authority to take action if they felt that that action was necessary. Uh, convener, if I were to find that a local authority uh, were not to be taking actions required, then I would uh, consider invoking uh, the powers that I have under the 2003 Act uh, and dealing with that enforcement myself. Thanks. Okay. Um, a few more lines of questioning, specifically around the Glasgow situation before we move on. So if members are seeking my uh, attention to come in, please bear that in mind. Mr Simpson. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm relieved to hear that uh, the fire service now know where, where these buildings are uh, and that by the end of today you'll have looked at them all. Um, but do the people living in these buildings know yet, because this was a line of questioning last week, have they been told? Convener, um, again, that would be um, the responsibility uh, of Glasgow to inform the building owners um, and I would expect the building owners to inform residents. In terms of uh, the question that Patrick Harvey posed last week, I, I would go further than that and have the expectation um, that if 
uh, the information comes through that there is difficulties in the building, that we would, uh, that Glasgow uh, building owners and others would cooperate in doing a door-to-door um, uh, information uh, 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 handling service, because uh, I think that's what people would deserve. However, convener, as it stands at this moment in time, we are still not certain about what the situation is in all of these buildings. Uh, and I think that we need to get all of that information, which I said earlier, Glasgow hopes to have by the end of the, this week, uh, and then we can look to see what is required in that regard. Convener, as in every other situation, um, what I would say is, if um, the government can help uh, in some way, um, in terms of disseminating information, uh, we would do so. Um, the building owners themselves, of course, would have the responsibility um, to deal uh, with any uh, situation that is found to be wanting, uh, according to the building standards um, regime. But that is where we are at. We still do not have all of the information to get to that point. Um, and, you know, I, I again refer uh, to the situation uh, of the Glasgow p press release last week, which says uh, in it that as far as they're concerned, there are no safety issues at this moment. I, I mean, as I said last week, uh, Minister, I, I don't think it's up to, to you or the working group to inform the owners. I think uh, that's just a matter of courtesy uh, from Glasgow City Council, that they don't appear to have followed. And I, I do have a concern that it's, it, it's taken till only yesterday uh, for them to allow your officials in. You know, giving, given the uh, furore that happened last week, I would have thought they'd have pulled their fingers out, uh, having dragged their feet for weeks and weeks and weeks, refused offers of help. Um, Given, given that they're effectively on notice, um, you've, you've given them only a, a year's verification. What, um, what, what, what's your feeling about what will happen if they fail your stringent tests after that year? Uh, convener, I am going to keep a very close eye uh, on all of this. Um, we were going to be doing so uh, prior to this situation anyway. Um, we will look at what the audit brings out um, and we will look for improvement. Uh, and if improvement does not take place, then obviously um, I have to consider uh, whether I use my powers uh, to appoint uh, another uh, verifier uh, to deal with the, the, the situation in Glasgow. Okay. okay. Are other members on the Glasgow situation? Mr Whiteman? Thank you, Convener. Um, just to clarify a point Mr McGowan made about inspections of 42 of these 57 buildings, you undertook, as I understand, these as, as part of routine visits, and presumably you were inspecting stairwells, alarms, sprinkler systems, doors, that things operated. Just to be clear, you were not inspecting the cladding or, or anything like that, because although, as the Minister says, our information is still a bit un incomplete, what appears to be the case is that all these buildings complied with the building regs when they were built. They were built to pre-2005 uh, standards. And according to Glasgow City Council, they don't have any evidence that they pose any fire risk. So just to be clear, you, you were not looking at that. Maybe you can give a brief indication of the kind of things you were looking at. Yeah, absolutely. Um, without going into too much of the technical detail around about the legislation, um, building owners in such premises have a responsibility to ensure that what we class as the common areas, so the common stairwells and access to the building and access into those common areas and then into the flats is, is maintained to a standard which allows firefighters to attend, fight the fire safely, and it's also for the protection of firefighters themselves. The buildings themselves don't come under the scope of legislation which it would require a fire safety um, enforcement audit to take place. They would be classed as relevant premises. These are not relevant premises. So our programme of quarterly um, operational intelligence and reassurance visits are, are, for, are for those two distinct purposes. So first of all, to provide reassurance, particularly after Grenfell, to the residents of the buildings, but perhaps more importantly, to gather operational intelligence for firefighters and fire crews 
to ensure that they have sufficient uh, means of access. So they do look at the roads accessing the building, they look at means of access into the building. We will look at the, um, the integrity of fire resisting doors. We look at the clearance of the stairways, the presence of um, rising mains and fire lifts, but we won't look at other aspects that would be looked at under a fire safety audit. So it is quite comprehensive, but we certainly, you're absolutely right, we do not look at, we don't have the responsibilities nor the particular skills to look at what could be classed as intrusive inspections into cladding and the presence of cladding and whatever grade that cladding uh, might be as well. So it's a distinct responsibility that the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service has in that, in that regard, which we discharge through our uh, programme of quarterly inspections. OK, that's helpful. Thank you. OK, any other members on the Glasgow situation? Alexander Stewart. Thank you, convener. Convener, the minister talked about responsibility, and I think that is the crux of this whole matter, uh, that the Glasgow City Council had a responsibility. The owners of the buildings have a responsibility. The fire service have a responsibility. And all within that, uh, Everyone playing their part uh, would assume that everything would work. Uh, obviously, here we had a communication breakdown uh, and it went awry. Uh, now, what lessons can be learned from this whole process? You know, the fire service are looking at how they can tighten things up. You, Minister, have said that if things don't happen, uh, you will take powers that you have that you could use. Uh, but, you know, the, 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 the situation should never have arisen at a committee meeting uh, that, that it did last week uh, for us to find out that kind of information. Uh, and, and that's the bit that really bothers me, uh, that it, it only came to light because of some questioning that happened where all these organisations have a responsibility and that responsibility was not managing or was not managing to filter through to make sure that everyone was safe uh, or secure or there was no anxiety uh, that these buildings could have a problem. Uh, so it, it's how we manage that and learn from that uh, because as I say you know the, the situation could have been much worse uh, if we hadn't been aware of it or if something had happened in the interim uh, when we assumed that responsibilities were being carried out. Convener, uh, I agree with uh, Mr Stewart that we uh, need to look at the communication uh, situation in all of this. I think that uh, you know in terms of the line of questioning uh, that the committee had last week and you know, having sat on the other side, my line of questioning would not have been any different. Um, you know, I am very disappointed uh, in the answers um, that were given, uh, the lack of clarity that was given uh, in response. Um, I think it could have been said without any difficulty whatsoever, because the committee, as everyone else out there was aware, it, 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 we had 31 local authorities who had reported back saying that they had no difficulties with private uh, rented high-rise, uh, private high-rise, sorry, convener. Um, we had one authority. Yeah. Now, I think that uh, it could have been said quite easily here last week that we are still working through. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, may have a difficulty, um, but we have uh, been asked to provide further information and to go back and check so that we can give people uh, the real information that they require and that we will take any action uh, that is required if we find anything that requires that action. That could have been done mm -hmm. last week. Um, that in itself, you know, bothers me to a huge degree. Um, and you could be assured, you know, that we will be doing everything that we can uh, to make sure that local authorities um, are open and transparent about all of this because we have been as open and transparent as possible right the way through this in terms of everything you know that has come to light whether that be in terms of uh, hospitals um, and uh, and so on and so forth and I would expect that openness and transparency or the public will lose trust yep. in what we're doing. Uh, beyond that, convener, in terms of responsibilities, and Mr Stewart rightly outlined the responsibilities of building owners, uh, councils, the Fire and Rescue Service, my officials and others. We also have a responsibility um, as uh, elected members to make sure that during the course of all of this, if we need to tighten up regulation, if we need to change legislation, then we can do so. Um, convener, our legislation here um, is much more robust than it is elsewhere 
um, uh, uh, on these islands. But I'm not complacent about that. Um, and I think, you know, we need to take a, a long, hard look. And I will uh, be uh, pouring over uh, the recommendations that this committee makes and also taking uh, the advice of the experts that we are putting in place and others, um, including um, uh, parties who do not serve on the ministerial working group, labs, the FBU, and convener, I have been over the course of the piece going and talking to tenants too in, in Aberdeen um, and in Glasgow, where I talked to residents, tenants from uh, Glasgow, the Lanarkshires, Inverclyde and others. Uh, and I think we have to take on board what they have to say too in terms of getting this absolutely right. The 2003 Act um, itself um, is, if I, if, if I can say, it, is a fairly good piece of legislation. And the fact that it allows us to change regulation um, on the advice uh, of uh, experts um, quite quickly. Um, and, you know, I think that is one of the reasons why our legislation is more robust, because we have been able to react but we have also been proactive uh, in terms of changes as and when required. So, yes, responsibilities for all of these folks, but we also have a responsibility in making sure that, you know, that we take the action that's required in any changes in legislation uh, and regulation too. I'm going to bring in Jenny Goldbruth to move on from the Glasgow situation. Minister, I hope I did my job as a Glasgow MSP properly if I didn't just put on the record um, that all social rented high-rises in Glasgow do not have this combustible or ACM cladding and that they are safe. I've got many, many high-rises in my constituency in Glasgow, Maryhill and Springburn and I have a constituents contact me because people watching the tale and reading the newspapers don't always pick up the message. They just hear there are properties that could be at risk and I've had worried constituents contacting me from social housing in my constituency and I've been able to reassure them, but just getting that key, mes key message again today that those properties are safe. So if you could do that in a second, Minister, I'd be very grateful as, as an MSP uh, in Glasgow, but also that there will be hard-working, diligent officials in Glasgow City Council today working as hard as they can to get all the required information who are just doing their job. They're not part of that internal decision-making process of how of how they deal with building warrants. They are just doing their job. And what I suppose they will want to hear, and the people of Glasgow want to hear, is that we've moved on from what Glasgow has or hasn't done well. It's self-evident they've done a lot of things that have been pretty poor. But this is now a partnership approach with Scottish Government, and this is under control, and we can move forward on that basis. Uh, Convener, first of all, can I say uh, and give the uh, assurance that all social housing uh, in Glasgow uh, are free from this material and go further than that and say that we have reports from all 32 local authorities that that material is not on social, socially rented properties anywhere in Scotland. Like you, Convener, um, I have a, a fair amount of high-rises within my constituency. Aberdeen has 59, uh, most of which are in my constituency. And I want to be able to say to folk throughout Scotland, you know, that all 32 local authorities have reported back and there has been no findings of any of that cladding, kind of cladding used in Grenfell on any socially rented property in Scotland, any high-rise socially rented property in Scotland. Um, convener, um, yes, uh, some folk um, are sitting at their desks and doing other things, probably out and about looking at this and doing the job that they are being asked to do, um, and I thank them for doing that job. Uh, you're right, we now have uh, Scottish Government help uh, in Glasgow. Uh, we should move forward. The key thing for me in all of this, and I think the key thing for everyone should be, is gathering up all of the required information. As I stated earlier, uh, from the email that we received this morning, it looks like that that work will be completed uh, by uh, Friday. They are on track to do so. Uh, we must work in partnership to make sure uh, that that is done, uh, and then we move forward in taking the necessary actions from there. Jenny Goldruth. 
Wagner. Um, just to kind of broaden it out a bit, a bit in terms of the, the remit of the Ministerial Working Group, it's a technical question about how that information was gathered in the first instance. Um, we heard a couple of weeks ago now from the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations that they conducted a survey with their members. Um, likewise, COSLA told us they conducted a, a desktop exercise. How was that information communicated um, to local authorities originally? Was it through a letter? How did you ask them to gather that data in the first instance? Uh, we asked local authorities um, to, to gather up data. We've also asked others uh, to help us uh, gather up data too, um, including the, the likes of the Scottish uh, Property uh, Federation. Uh, we've also uh, asked uh, internally um, uh, other uh, government uh, departments to look at aspects of their estate, health obviously, um, the prison service, um, and, uh, you know, a, a, a number of others. Um, I'm looking to colleagues here. Uh, I've probably missed a number of folk off that list. Mm. Uh, if I could hand over to Mr Dodds, please, convener. Yes, it was an evolving task through the Ministerial Working Group. Initially, it was high-rise domestic social housing. We wrote a letter. The Minister, Mr Stewart, wrote a letter out. And then it became apparent as we were going through the process that more and more detailed information would be required, for example, with schools, We'd asked for heights of buildings, areas, and so on and so forth. We we're very much following the, the UK government uh, process as, because we were getting this information released to us uh, bit by bit. And so it, it was quite a, an evolutionary process. We started uh, initially with letters, then pro formas. And I think it became quite apparent that the level of detail and the level of information that housing associations, for example, held was sometimes uh, quite extensive, but sometimes limited. And that's why I think the Ministry of Working Group took the decision to have a building inventory of all high-rise buildings in Scotland. And so therefore, we're working now with contractors to develop uh, an inventory that will have all high-rise buildings, the, the kind of age of them, the type of them, and that will help to inform us of future decisions and ministerial decisions on what other measures we may want to take on existing stock. So it's, it's horses for courses, the different building types, the type of information we were requiring. But essentially, it was ACM, is it present? What's the extent of it? What's the age of the building, heights of buildings? It was that type of information we're looking at. And it was very much building-based, depending on the nature of the risk of the building type. Convener, one of the others which I missed off the list, and I think it's important to put on the record, is that we also asked the uh, Scottish Funding Council uh, for help in terms of student accommodation too. When that data came in, uh, on reflection now, if there will be any physical inspections by anyone from the government centrally going out and working directly to check that the information submitted was accurate? Um, I'll hand over to Mr Dodds in terms of the technicalities and then I'll come back. I think that's something that the, the, the working group that's been set up for the enforcement side, and I know that the committee in previous sessions have, have obviously heard a fair bit of evidence about it's all very well having it on paper, and you've got plans in the office, how do we know that that product's the product that's found its way onto the building? We have had limited examples of products being substituted or so on and so forth, so it's by no means certain that what's on the building warrant and what's been specified has found its way onto the building, and that, that is a big issue. And I think you're quite right to, to raise that, and that's something that John Cole will take forward as part of his review uh, of the enforcement and compliance with building regulations to make sure not only is the paperwork correct when the building warrant is issued, but there is a, a means of signing off to make sure that what was specified is actually what's, what's appearing on, on the buildings. We don't have widespread knowledge of that happening. There have been limited examples of that and they've been reported in the press and things have been, have been dealt with. Um, but by and large, the, the processes that have been gone through have, 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 have demonstrated that what's been found on the buildings has been compliant with building regulations at the time the buildings were built. At Convener, we have an example of uh, Napier University where um, you know something went on the building that shouldn't have been there. They discovered that very quickly and took action. Again, um, I would reiterate the point um, that building owners are responsible. Now, any building owner in Scotland uh, who has any dubiety um, about uh, the cladding um, can send that cladding um, for testing. Um, 
to make doubly certain, uh, if you like. Um, so that is available uh, to, to building owners too. Uh, and we can disseminate that information uh, to the committee. That's an offer that has been made by the UK government. Thank you. Just one wee of question. Course, Thank yes. you, Kavita. Uh, Minister, you said in your opening statement that everyone who has requested a home fire safety visit has received one. So this is perhaps a, a question to Mr McGowan. Um, these visits are obviously not compulsory and we know that more vulnerable groups uh, are not likely to you know, offer themselves up for these kind of visits. Um, have you prioritised certain groups and have you given direction in terms of who should be taken first for these visits? Um, as part of our normal work, even before Grenfell, we do a lot of work with partners in, at, uh, in a local area to identify who the most vulnerable are in our communities so that we can concentrate our resources and offer home fire safety visits to them. A lot of the times they actually come through a referral process. So that's part of our work that we're actually looking to do a lot more of in the coming years. And we're conducting a bit of research at the moment and we're working with health and social care to try and identify quite forensically and specifically who is the most vulnerable, mm -hmm. not in terms of households, in terms of individuals. Yep. That, that's who we want to concentrate on. In terms of the work that's happened round about home fire safety visits since Grenfell, we've prioritised those and effectively for the, the purpose of public reassurance, anybody who's asked for a home fire safety visit who lives in a high-rise premise have been prioritised along with those others who we deem to be most vulnerable. Previously, we would have assessed um, the risk and the risk and the likelihood of them having a fire, mm -hmm. but simply because of Grenfell and to provide a little bit more reassurance, if they've asked for one, then they've, then they've received one. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, um, Graham Simpson. So, moving on into other areas, convener, um, if that's okay. Yeah, of course. Um, so, um, you may have seen a, a report on the, the, the BBC uh, this morning, um, which was to do with sprinklers in, in high rise flats. Um, they'd done some research, uh, some FOIs uh, through the, uh, the fire service, actually. Um, they discovered that since 2009, uh, 15 people have died and more than 480 have been hurt in high-rise fires. And high-rise fires are uh, buildings over 10 storeys, um, according to the fire service. Um, but um, there was no deaths in any building where there was a sprinkler system, uh, and only one of those casualties uh, was in a a tower block with a sprinkler system. So I just wondered uh, if that, um, if you know, on that basis, and I realise it's just very, you know, basic figures, um, whether that tells you anything about whether we should have, you know, more more sprinkler systems, say, in blocks where they don't exist. Can I can I maybe go first and then I'll uh, take in Mr. McGowan because I think that report also had comment from uh, Brian Sweeney, uh, ex fire officer, if I remember rightly from my reading very early this morning, um, and he also talked about other factors um, as well, yep. which may uh, make a difference. And I'll take Mr. McGowan in uh, in terms of technicalities and all of this, um, and use his expertise. But what I can say, convener, to Mr Simpson is that the uh, Ministerial Working Group has already said that it is going to look uh, carefully at all of these situations in terms of the use of fire suppression systems. Uh, beyond that, convener, I'm actually grateful uh, to members, uh, to fellow MSPs, who have actually provided us with information um, about new products on the market uh, which could be used in terms of fire suppression um, and uh, uh, jointly uh, between the fire service and building standards we're looking at, at these things as well. Obviously, um, convener, um, one of the, the, the things that we have done and that I've announced today is that um, uh, group and you know we will look and see what Dr Paul Stollard comes back with um, in this regard. We will interrogate all of this information at the Ministerial Working Group uh, and we will look at all of this very carefully indeed. And I'll hand you over to Mr McGowan, convener. Um, thank you. Yes, um, you're absolutely right, Minister. It was the, the fire service that provided those um, figures which are absolutely factual. Just to provide a little bit of context, 
Um, and it's absolutely not to make light of um, 15 tragic deaths in high-rise premises since 2009. Um, Scotland experiences approximately um, 40 to 45 fire deaths per year. Um, those have been on a steady decline and continue to be in a steady decline. So over that period of about eight years when um, 15 fire deaths occurred in high-rise premises, Scotland would have experienced, or in, in the nature of 360, I would get a prop exact figures, but in the nature of 360 fire deaths. So actually the majority of our fire deaths in Scotland occur out with high-rise premises, but as I say, that's not to diminish the fact that tragically 15 people died in high-rise premises, and there is something we can and should do about that. Um, what we focus on in the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, similar to what I was talking about regarding our home fire safety visits, is the, the prevention measures, and in particular, quite bespoke and new and in innovative prevention measures to allow us to stop fire deaths in the future. And most of our fire deaths um, occur as you might expect, um, to the most vulnerable. It's the most vulnerable in society who, who tend to succumb from uh, uh, within a fire. And those can be, in the majority of cases, in many cases in the last few years, single private dwellings in remote rural locations, which are at the other end of the scale of somebody living in a high-rise um, high building. So um, it's just to emphasise that we're doing a lot of work at the moment, and we've actually just commissioned a, a piece of research between the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service um, the Fire Industry Association and also the uh, Buildings Research Establishment in Watford who are carrying out the, the tests on cl uh, cladding at the moment mm -hmm. to look quite specifically at what we can do in the future to, uh, to target better those most vulnerable and provide, as I said, quite bespoke and quite innovative ways to improve their chances or, or rather reduce the chances of having a fire but improve their chances of surviving if they do ha happen to have a fire. There is already quite established research taking place regarding the use of sprinklers um, or automatic fire suppression systems, because there's quite a wide range of automatic fire suppression systems that you can put into a building, whether it's of an industrial use or whether it's somebody's um, dwelling. Um, we're quite keen. Our position is that the use of water suppression systems in an automatic nature can be very effective indeed. Mm. Every piece of research shows that. The piece in the BBC this morning um, backs that up. However, we think it would be more effective to apply resource and install such systems where the need is on a risk-based approach rather than um, sprinkler buildings um, per, per, per se. So um, that research, we, we assume, will back up uh, research that's happened before, that's been conducted before in the last five or six years. But we actually wanted to say something quite specific about Scotland and um, hence the reason why the BRE have approached Scotland because of our can-do approach to doing something specific about this, this particular problem of trying to reduce fire deaths across the country. So is the, the, the BRE study, is that just looking at uh, the, the most vulnerable in society or is it, is, it a, is it a wider thing about fire safety systems? Um, it's specifically looking at the most vulnerable because we already have quite a range of evidence to identify who the most vulnerable might be and those tend to be the ones, as I say, who not just necessarily have a fire, but tend to succumb from a fire. But we are only talking, I say, only 40 to 45 fire deaths per year. Yeah. It will not ignore the fact that we have to continue um, installing prevention measures in other people's houses, because we're, we are talking about thousands of people, not just identifying 40 or 45, it's thousands of people across Scotland. So we will focus on the most vulnerable, but that's not to the exclusion of um, other properties and other individuals who may be at risk. I'm just um, going to ask you about something else, and it's some of the evidence that we've heard, um, and that is where people do um, small-scale repairs uh, in their homes, and they may start off with, say, a fire door. Um, they'll do some DIY or get some tradesmen in, whatever, uh, and they put a, a replacement door that's not a fire door. Um, so that has been a concern for the committee. Is, the, is this being addressed by the government or the working group? We'll certainly take a look at, uh, at that, um, convener. As it stands at the moment, if somebody was to replace a, a fire door, there's no building warrant required for that. Yeah. But that fire door, uh, that replacement, uh, should be of no lesser quality and rigour than the one uh, that it is replacing. Um, I have noted uh, over the piece that the committee has asked a number of questions uh, around about this, 
um, I will uh, ensure that we uh, look at that um, and that the groups that we're establishing, establishing take a, a look at that to see um, if that's an area that needs to be tightened up. Can, can I just check, Minister, before we move on, there's ongoing consultations um, in relation to smoke alarms and, and fire alarms at the moment. I'm just conscious that um, the other reviews ongoing that will look at sprinkler systems and other form of fire suppression systems as well, will they be linked somehow? Because obviously there's a, there's a mixture of of methods that can be used to, to mitigate against fire spreading or stop them starting in the first place. So will that be looked at in isolation uh, or will it link into these other ongoing consultations? Uh, convener, we brought forward um, the uh, consultation uh, on uh, fire and smoke alarms in domestic dwellings. Um, it was due to uh, come to pass later on this year, uh, but we brought it forward um, to, uh, uh, to, to uh, see what is required in that regard. I think it was Mr Stewart at one of your previous meetings um, that uh, had said that some of the emphasis of late has been on the private rented sector because that was the area um, that has uh, seemed to be uh, most risky. Uh, and that's the case we've developed um, uh, much better regulation uh, in the private rented sector. It's now time for um, the social rented sector and owner occupiers um, to catch up in that regard. Um, that piece of work, it's a 12-week consultation, um, and then we will look at um, what is required uh, from there, what that brings back and what is required. Anything in terms of um, fire suppression um, would come later. Obviously, the ministerial working group needs to have a rigorous look at all of this and take the advice from the Fire and Rescue Service, um, from our building standards colleagues and from others, um, including the groups that we've, we've established before we make a move in that regard. Can, can I just check as well, if, if, if there was a move in relation to, to sprinkler systems or, or other systems, would, do we know just now, in terms of record keeping, in relation to properties that are high rise, those that do or don't have sprinkler systems, is that recorded uh, within local authority building warrant records? Or where would that be held? Or would 32 local authorities then just have to go through their records again to look at that? Or would we just ask people, would we just change the law and then they would have to comply with that change in the law? And there's a lot in that, but I'm just conscious how do we know what the current situation is with sprinklers other than the legislative situation? I'll bring in Mr Dodds first, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's a good question. The, again, the building inventory that we're looking at will ask that specific question. Does your high-rise building have sprinklers fitted? And part of the question is around uh, the, the readiness for an existing high-rise building to be able to facilitate sprinklers. You know, Not all buildings are structurally sound enough to take the installation retrospectively of sprinklers. So at the present time, I, I think it's safe to say that there's only a limited use in existing high-rise buildings of sprinklers just now. There's, there's not that many uh, within Scotland. We did ask briefly uh, one of those early information requests, but again, what it threw up was the requirement to have this more detailed, structured look at the existing stock to, to see exactly what it was. But, the installation of a sprinkler system would require a building warrant. So yes, we would be able to find out if, if the committee wanted uh, quite quickly. But again, we have asked local authorities for many pieces of information. They've been very supportive of us. That we are trying our best through the ministerial working gr group to focus the, the, the information requests to the, the priority areas. And that's why we felt the building inventory that we could go and ask a contractor or, or, or someone to go and work with local authorities to get all that essential information to us. Uh, uh, convener, uh, I think that, you know, in all of this, we've been quite methodical in terms of the work that we have been carrying out. Um, as I said in my opening statement, this is pretty intensive work. Um, and, you know, in the main, um, local authorities and other bodies have responded extremely well to the requests for information. Um, 
others have asked me um, why we focused in certain areas first, and that's obviously those domestic properties have been the, the main focus where folk um, are sleeping at night. Um, but we have been working through um, uh, that list uh, methodically. Mr. Um, uh, Dodds maybe wants to say something about current standards and suppression systems, which I think is also important uh, for the committee to, to know about new um, standards for new buildings. Thanks, Minister. Absolutely. And the, the working party that we, we, we have, the one that we have, is looking at the new building codes or the new building regulations. And uh, they'll be charged with looking at the latest research. And we've undertaken research a number of times along with uh, our fire service colleagues about looking at, uh, you know, at, at what type of building should we be looking at. And, you know, so, for, for example, over 18 metres high-rise buildings need sprinklers. We introduce sprinklers to schools. And there's a, a programme of looking at the latest research and then changing the regulations. And so, for example, the next uh, couple of building types that we'll be looking at will probably be it will definitely be um, student accommodation and hotels and other other high-rise buildings that have sleeping accommodation. So that will be very much part of the focus of the work that we're taking forward in, in the future. So we're, we're absolutely not complacent in any way that, um, and we, like my fire service colleague there, we are absolutely convinced that sprinklers have a role to play. Uh, not just a new build, and uh, but has, we have to draw the distinction about putting it into new buildings, and the the you know the retrofitting of quite intrusive systems into to existing buildings. They need to be dealt with probably separately. Okay, okay we'll, we'll move on from that, Mr. Whiteman. Thank you very much, convener. Um, as uh, Mr. Dodd said earlier today. It's the building owner's responsibility for ensuring the safety, upkeep and maintenance of, of, of buildings. We've heard quite a lot of complaints about enforcement of building regulations, and obviously that's an issue, and that's an issue that Mr Cole will be taking forward uh, to, to look at. But my question really is over the longer term. Uh, you know, some of these buildings are 100 years old or so, and when people buy a property, they really don't know what's in it or what work's being done. Um, even whether there's been a breach of building regulations sometime in the past that could have an impact on the building, not necessarily just for fire, but obviously for structural reasons and all the rest of it. Um, so I'm wondering if that will form part of um, Professor Cole's um, remit and whether, I mean, I should look at your news release you put up at uh, six minutes past ten this morning. It doesn't actually include the remit of the two working groups. I wonder if you could provide the committee with a copy of the actual remit. Um, convener, uh, I will do that. Um, I have announced the chairs today. I have not had the opportunity to meet with the chairs to talk about REMA, and I would do that, first of all, uh, before um, dictating what that REMA should be, because we need to use their expertise to have a look and see what they think requires to be done. Um, the reason why I've not had the opportunity uh, to meet with them is because one of uh, the gentlemen uh, only agreed yesterday, and uh, and that's uh, I, I will meet with them, and we will let the committee know what those remits are um, uh, after the discussions I have with them. Thank you. Oh, okay, that's helpful. So these two people have taken on the role without knowing what the remit is. I, I think they've got a, a broad overview of what the remit of the work that they um, are about to embark on. Uh, they're both experts in the field, uh, but there are obviously things that uh, they may want to look at uh, in some depth, and I'm not going to uh, rule uh, that out. Uh, Mr uh, Dodds knows these two individuals uh, much better than I do. Uh, I've had a, a fair amount of dealings with Professor Cole of late, uh, and I think that the committee would uh, probably agree that in terms of his report on Edinburgh schools, um, he did a, a, a robust job, um, and I would hope that, um, uh, that the same thing will uh, apply in terms of uh, the role that we've asked him uh, to do here. Mr Dodds. 
Yeah, the, we have shared draft remits with both of the, the uh, chairs. Um, um, at the present time, they're, they're reviewing those, and of course they will want to see those um, and, and work their way through. And the particular question you asked about existing buildings, there was a previous committee in the Parliament here looked at that, that, that very issue about existing buildings. At the present time, the building standards system looks after uh, new buildings. Um, there were powers introduced in 2003 for defective buildings that gave local authorities the ability to be able to establish, before something became dangerous, if a chimney just started to look a bit shaky but wasn't dangerous. So we have increased the powers for local authorities to deal with defective buildings. It's a discretionary power. But um, we had, a, as I say, a committee meeting looking at uh, aspects of, of dangerous buildings and building MOTs. And, and I know that there are some pilots going on looking at some of the issues around some of our historic buildings and the, 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 you know but that's not uh, scheduled to be part of this this remit um, at, at the present time and it's something that i can discuss with mr stewart if he wants to, to, to okay well i can do no more than you. encourage yeah. um convener um if it's helpful to the committee there are some good graphs uh, in terms of the procedures that should be followed uh, in local authorities to deal with dangerous and defective buildings uh, that we can pass on to the committee. It's, it, it's quite easy to understand and it would give you uh, an indication of how all of that works. The information you provide would be, would be very welcome. We will do yes. that, Convener. Yeah. Mr Dodge, did you want to add to that? No, no, that's, right. that's, that's okay. absolutely fine. Mr Whiteman, do you want to follow up on any of that? Well, I encourage you to, to, to have a remit that, do, that could look at this because you talk about building a database of high-rise buildings. Um, I mean, obviously the owners, there's you know, just 57 in Glasgow alone that were the subject of the controversy regarding um, uh, cladding, etc. Let's assume there's 30 properties in each. There may well be more. That's 1,500 or 2,000 um, owners. And obviously they buy a flat, it met the building regs. Well, they wouldn't even question whether it built the building regs. But now, 5, 10, 15, 20 years later, we know more. And yet those owners, as private individuals, are not going around testing their cladding or whatever. Um, it's very difficult for them to understand that the building they live in might need some attention. So that's a problem that occurs in the short term. But even then, in the longer term, 40, 50, 60 years down the line, problems can arise as a consequence of our new understandings about buildings, about materials and all the rest of it. And it seems to me quite important that the remit should include, not exclusively, obviously, but should include some consideration of how we maintain institutional knowledge going from generation to generation about what's in a building, what work's been done and what standards were applied. C convener, um, I will reflect on what Mr Whiteman has asked for there. I'm not going to commit to anything. Uh, because at the end of the day, as I've pointed out, there is a raft of work that has to be undertaken here. Um, and, you know, we have done it methodically. Um, I think that adding a number of other things into the mix at this moment uh, may not be the right thing to do. Um, but I will reflect on what Mr Whiteman has uh, requested uh, and look at that in some depth discuss with my officials uh, and take a decision after that. Mr Whiteman? Okay, that's helpful. Um, I have a number of questions about the database of high-rise buildings, but I'm aware we're short of time, so perhaps you could come back with some more information about the scope of that database, how frequently it will be updated, um, what information you'll be seeking from owners, and what the purpose of that is for the longer term insurance of the safety of high-rise buildings has rolled up all the questions that we'd be keen to yeah. ask so uh, i'm more than willing reflection on that just now and you could write to us more than willing to write uh, yeah. in detail on that point or any other point convener yeah that, that's very helpful we'd like to know that uh, mr stewart you've got some questions thank you can you we, we we've, we've we've heard some evidence uh with reference to the skills shortage that seems to be taking place uh, in in the building industry and that has had a, a knock-on effect about how uh, things have progressed and the standards that are, are, are going forward. Uh, I mean, what is the Scottish Government's view on, on how that should be addressed and what are they doing uh, to tackle that skill shortage? Uh, convener, um, I, uh, on my day-to-day -day business, uh, have been visiting a, a fair number of bu building sites in, in recent times. 
Uh, and one of the things which I always do and always ask if I'm on a, a building site is if there are any apprentices there because uh, I'm keen to hear uh, their views because they are the future uh, of the industry. And uh, it is uh, almost to a man and a woman, and we are seeing more women, I'd like to see more uh, in the construction industry, uh, would say, say that they are enjoying their apprenticeship. And when asked the question, would you encourage uh, your mates uh, to, to join the industry? The answer is yes. Um, now, I think that we need to promote uh, uh, in, in conjunction uh, with the construction industry itself, uh, the the trade and how how good a, a job, how good a career entering construction can be. Um, convener, it is disappointing that in some regards it is the smaller um, building companies that have more apprentices than some of the larger ones. Uh, and I would encourage um, the larger construction companies to look at workforce planning uh, and uh, to, um, uh, to take on more apprentices. I know that my colleague Jamie Hepburn has had a number of discussions uh, with the CITB and others around uh, about apprenticeships um, and other issues uh, in terms of, of getting folk into the construction industry. I don't have all of the detail of that to hand, convener, uh, but I'm more than willing to uh, find out from Mr Hepburn uh, exactly what has been going on in that regard and pass that to Mr Stewart. One other thing, uh, convener, in terms of the construction industry, uh, a conservative estimate at this moment says that 10% of the, uh, the construction uh, industry workers in Scotland are European. Um, and some of the sites I visited, including one in my own patch in Aberdeen, 70% of the construction workers uh, on that site uh, were European nationals. Now, it would be uh, a great loss uh, to us, um, a, a disaster, in fact, uh, if these folks uh, were to, to go uh, and to leave Scotland um, uh, and leave the industry here. Mr Stewart, want to follow up? Uh, I think that the, the, uh, the Minister makes a very valid point uh, about the, the role of apprenticeships uh, and coming through and making sure that we have that, that stream of people. Uh, but at the other end of the scale for the, the individuals who are older in the, in, the, in the process, but also trying to encourage people to, to become more involved in the industry, I think is, is very important uh, for us to go forward and, and make sure that we have a, a collective responsibility uh, of ensuring that uh, the industry is, is uh, progressing effectively. Uh, and I think you, you also make a very valid point about the, the EU nationals. And, the, and as I say, I think it's very important that we, we do all we can to ensure that that is the case. But the main, the main thrust of it, uh, Minister, would be about how we, how we develop that skill base and how you ensure that skill base that continues to grow uh, and, and develops within the industry itself. Uh, and, and, and things that the Scottish Government can do uh, to ensure that that is uh, the case uh, and providing uh, some support, uh, some mechanisms uh, to ensure that they have that workforce planning and they have that understanding uh, going forward. You know, I, I've made some suggestions to industry as I've been going out and about. Um, here in, in Edinburgh, a, a, a site in Pennywell, um, which is uh, a, an area which is being regenerated um, and you know, we've got good quality uh, housing going in there. I had the opportunity to meet three apprentices there, two of whom uh, were uh, very local uh, and lived very close to the site that they were working on. One who lived in Edinburgh, but uh, not so far uh, away. Um, they uh, were keen to tell me that, uh, you know, they had never uh, thought about the building industry at school and while uh, you know a lot of other things came up in terms of discussion at school in terms of careers mm -hmm. construction was not one of those things uh, and I do think that you know industry itself um, it would be good for them to to get into schools at an early stage we've seen uh, in the northeast of Scotland we've seen for a while a, a real problem in terms of recruitment and 
in oil and gas. Um, and industry there went into schools to encourage folk um, into, that, into that career path. I think that, you know, the same can be done with construction. Um, and anything that I can do in that regard or anything that I can do to, to help with ministerial colleagues to allow that to happen, I would do so. Thank you. Can you? Okay, thank you. Now, it's a time kit check to, to members here. We're, we're over our time, but uh, maybe run this to about 10 past 11, and then we need to move on because we've got another, another panel of witnesses. So hopefully we can get some more questions in in that time. Elaine Smith. Thanks, convener. Um, yeah, I have a few questions to help with our general look at um, the building standards issues. Just on that last question that Alexander Stewart was asking, the last line of questioning, um, I do recall we did have a College of Building specifically in Glasgow, but I think that's now part of the wider Glasgow College, and I don't know whether that had any has had any bearing on um, on courses being run, etc. But maybe that's for another day. However, I would like to ask you, Minister, you mentioned something earlier about making sure that what's specified is actually used in construction and we did hear evidence that um, the use of clacker works can help to improve compliance with the building standards so I wonder if there's any proposals that you might have that for any um, action that you could bring forward to ensure that clerk of works are used in larger public and private sector projects um, I, I know obviously it would be difficult with, with the private sector projects but maybe if we're thinking about um, if you're thinking about contracts and when you're putting out contracts for bidding, is there any way that the procurement process could could um, contain something around the, the need for a clerk of works? Um, convener, there is separate work going on at this moment uh, on procurement um, of public buildings. Um, that is taking place in parallel. Uh, with the, the work that we are doing. Um, I have uh, said before, um, convener uh, to the Education Committee, uh, in terms of evidence I gave there uh, in regards to school buildings in the core report, uh, that the local authorities, and I, I, I've spoken to uh, 30 out of the 32 local authorities um, the day after Grenfell, which was um, primarily supposed to be about coal and became uh, about Grenfell, again, early action. At that meeting and other meetings that I've had since, those authorities, those public bodies uh, that have used Clark of Works uh, in terms of their projects, um, they have had the least problems um, in terms uh, of, of any... Uh, uh, defects at a later stage. So, you know, I think um, it is wise uh, not only uh, for the public sector but for the private sector to look at the personnel uh, that they have got on the ground because I think that, and this is my opinion, it seems to me that having a clerk of works, um, an experienced clerk of works, it would have to be. Um, uh, may actually be uh, spending to save uh, a, a lot in the future. Um, I could probably provide the committee uh, with some examples of, of that rather than just my anecdote, um, uh, which you know may not be 100% correct. The, the one that does stick in my mind was Fife were using Clark of Works in their major uh, projects. Uh, and they had very, very little um, difficulty. I'm looking at Mr Dodds to see if my memory serves me well, convener. I think Glasgow raised that last week when they were giving the evidence as well about their schools, the Jez Clark works. OK, um, could I move on then? I think that was helpful, and we would appreciate, I'm looking at the convener, but we would appreciate the further information, Minister. As I say, I can uh, provide further information in terms of what is going on in Paramount parallel uh, around about procurement, if that That's, is useful to the committee. That would be helpful. Um, could I move on to perhaps the something around the verification issue? We've been taking evidence on whether or not um, it should be kept in the, the public sector. If you look uh, down south, then sometimes it isn't, and it's maybe 
private sector that carries out that role of the, the building control. Um, so I, I would be grateful for your thoughts on that, but if I could also just tie it up with, we've heard some calls for building standards fee income to be ring-fenced for the provision of building standards services. So I'd be grateful for your view on that suggestion. And also, I'm conscious of time, so I'm rolling all this up. Uh, we also had the, the report from Unison, which talks about, it's called Building Stress, Overwork Stress and Stuck in the Office. And in the key issues, it mentions that the um, overwhelming majority of respondents felt their workload had got heavier in the last few years. And they basically talked about... Um, they talked about morale being low and the reasons given were further budget cuts to local authorities, increased workload and the lack of a pay rise are key reasons why they wouldn't expect morale to get any better. So these are obviously concerns for the functioning of the whole building control sector, I think. So I'm afraid that was three things, Minister. First on verification of the public sector, the, the ring fencing of the income and then also on the report about the workforce in the sector? Um, convener, um, three things. First of all, I should probably refer members to my register of interests because I'm a member of Unison. Um, and uh, let me start off um, with uh, the verification function itself. I took the decision in May, um, if I remember rightly, May, yes, um, to uh, reappoint local authorities as the verifiers. Um, I did that after um, uh, reflecting uh, for a long while and looking at the evidence that I had. Um, and I did it differently um, from predecessors. I was not entirely happy, uh, as you have gathered from uh, previous answers, I'm sure, um, about performance um, in three of those local authorities. And that is why um, they have uh, been appointed, reappointed for one year only. Um, those authorities that were um, average were reappointed for three years. Those authorities that are doing well were reappointed um, for six years. I will continue to look at all of that um, uh, convener uh, as we move on. Um, if I were not to reappoint a local authority um, in a specific area, that doesn't mean that, you know, I would then necessarily go on and appoint the private sector. I could give that verification role to uh, a neighbouring authority, um, for example. Um, you can be assured, um, convener, that all of this I will keep looking at very, very closely indeed. Um, including the audits that I've talked about, which will take place in November. In terms of um, fees um, themselves, uh, the committee will be aware that um, I uh, took the decision to raise fees. Um, I've uh, gone uh, around uh, the country and have said that my expectation uh, would be that I've allowed for that increase in fees, some of which we will retain um, to beef up building standards here. Um, but I would expect that money um, to be used, that income, additional income to be used um, to uh, boost building standards services um, in local authorities. Uh, I should point out, um, convener, um, that some of the authorities um, that are not doing quite so well. It's not because of a lack of fees coming in. Um, and, you know, I will continue uh, to monitor that. Ms Smith is uh, well aware, convener, that this government has uh, tried not to uh, ring fence, tried not to dictate to local authorities what they should be doing in these regards. However, um, you know, I will keep an eye on this, and if there is no improvement, then I will obviously enter into discussions uh, with COSLA uh, around about this um, if there was a need, a felt need, to actually ring fence. Um, and in terms of the general scenario of um, 
of pay cap and work. Um, the First Minister uh, has made clear um, that this government will look to remove that pay cap. And in terms of, of work itself, it's incumbent of all employers, no matter who they are, whether they be in the public uh, or the private sector, um, to make sure that they are, their employees are in a positive place um, and that they uh, are not overly stressed or overly burdened. Thank you. Could I just briefly follow up then on um, the issue of if, if you're retaining some of that funding for uh, Mr Dodd's department, I presume is, is what you're talking about, Minister. Is there a place at all, and given the situation back to Glasgow of uh, the offer perhaps not being taken up quickly of the help, is there any, and, and I raised this a long time ago, it seems now in evidence when I was asking um, asking for comments way back at the start of this process of looking at building regulations. Is there any place for a sort of central flying squad type arrangement whereby um, there are uh, officers who could centrally take on a role um, around the whole building regulation verification process? Um, convener, Mr Dodds has kind of been the flying squad uh, of, of late. Um, I don't know if you will appreciate me uh, calling him that or not. Yeah, we'll find out when I go out of the room. On your CV going um, forward, Mr. Uh, one, one of the reasons why, um, Convener, um, we have retained some of that money is to beef up building standards division here because uh, an, a lot more of their work has been focused on helping uh, others uh, elsewhere. Um, as I've said, Mr Dodds has been to Stirling, he's been to Edinburgh, he's been to Glasgow, he's been to a lot of other places as well. And we have those additional audits which we would not normally have. I think, convener, you know, any local authority can call upon the expertise of building standards and we are putting in place a team uh, which will be able uh, to respond to any needs. As it stands at this moment in time, under the 2003 Act, building standards is still a matter for local authorities. And, you know, I think in terms of the verification and the enforcement, they are best placed on the ground to do that. However, you know, if they require additional expertise, then, you know, they know that they can come to us uh, uh, and get that. Beyond that, I would reiterate what I said previously, if there was an authority which was not performing um, uh, and not dealing uh, particularly uh, well with some of the situations that they face, then I would look to uh, use uh, my powers uh, under the 2003 Act uh, to, to deal with that. Um, and in order for me to deal with that, um, you know, I would have to rely on expertise probably from other authorities as well as from building standards division. My main focus is um, to ensure that the right emphasis is put on investment in building standards, not only just here um, in government, but also out there um, in all 32 local authorities. Uh, and I hope um, that, you know, all uh, elected members, whether that be here in this place or whether it be in local authorities, uh, will look um, at building standards a, a little more than we've maybe previously done um, in the past. One final, if nobody else. Okay, I've got a final one as well, but I'll, you ask yours first, uh, Miss Smith. I'm conscious we've got about three minutes left, so we're, both of us will have to be very brief. Thank you, Convener. Uh, yeah, it's a, a slightly different subject. The FBU highlighted a 24% fall in the number of uniformed fire safety inspection officers, which they said put cons uh, remaining staff under considerable pressure. So I wondered if the Scottish Government would look at fire safety inspection officer staffing and funding 
particularly in light of the increase in workloads? Um, I think it came to light during the course of debate last week that the government put in an extra 27.1 million, if I remember rightly, to the Fire and Rescue Service um, this financial year. Um, in terms of um, the inspectors themselves, uh, I'll let Mr McGowan answer. Uh, obviously, um, inspectors have been doing uh, an absolutely immense job of work uh, before Grenfell, but especially since Grenfell, uh, and I'm very thankful for, for the efforts that they have put in. <coughs> um, th thank you. J just to confirm the figures, at the start of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, there were 89 uniformed um, fire safety enforcement officers. Um, this year we have 73 posts, five are currently being filled at the moment. I think it's also important just to um, just to let the committee know that we also have 13 specialist non-uniformed auditing officers who carry out the same the same role as our fire safety enforcement officers. Our focus absolutely is on the work that those officers and our non-uniformed colleagues do and the outcomes as well. So, in terms of the number of audits, they have stayed stable over that period of time. We, we carry out upwards of 9,000 audits within relevant premises every year. But more importantly for us, what we're trying to achieve through those audits is the number of um, fires in non-domestic premises falling. And actually this year, within the first um, quarter of this year, they're at their lowest since the start of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. So we recognise the figures. The figures are absolutely, um, as I've just reported, however, our outcomes um, are greater than they, than they ever have been in terms of number of non-domestic fires since the start of the service, which for us, we, we want to continue to do so with the number of staff that we have. Thanks, Okay, um, a few more just mopping up exercise of some of the questions we'd hope to ask, so maybe just brief reflections or even just write to his minister in, in relation to some of these. C convener, yeah. if, if there's anything at all that you require, um, mm -hmm. then let us know and we will respond as quickly as we can by writing. OK, so I'm just going to put on the record two or three things because it'll inform what we're on report. Uh, we, we've heard that in relation to new build properties that sometimes fire safety assessments can fall between two stools where buildings are partially occupied uh, but not necessarily always uh, uh, having like we will clarify on that, but you know uh, uh, what you have had in evidence is not necessarily what happens. But we will clarify all of that with you. Okay, so the clar well, it's actually clarity, or to take on the suggestion that's been made that there should be a fire safety assessment of new build properties prior to completion certificate by the fire service. So we'll leave that sitting there. Um, the FBU have obviously suggested an intrusive. Uh, uh, inspection of all high-rise properties. M Mr. McGowan's already talk talked about the type of inspections that that, that that do already take place. I'll leave that sitting there. But finally, there didn't appear to be a standardised national standard for fire risk assessments, and there was a, a suggestion that there should be some kind of very specific national guidance to standardised approach uh, across the country. I'm not saying that's accurate, Minister. I'm just saying we've heard that in evidence, so we're duty bound, I think, to to raise that at committee whilst you're here. Sure. We've seen that evidence, um, convener. We will respond to you in writing with a, a detailed response about that. It's been a long evidence session, uh, Minister and Mr McGowan and Mr Dodds. Thank you very much for your time. Thank any you for the opportunity, Any convener. final remarks you want to make, Minister, uh, before we close this evidence session? Convener, obviously, um, I and the Ministerial Working Group will look very um, carefully um, at... Uh, the recommendations that the committee make. I think in terms of uh, all that we uh, need to do to make sure that people are safe in Scotland, uh, we need to work in partnership and I, I hope that um, uh, that we can do that with, with all partners right across Scotland to get this absolutely right. Okay, can I thank everyone for their time this morning. We'll suspend briefly but we'll be moving very, very quickly on to agenda item two. Thank you, gentlemen.
Okay. Um, good morning and welcome back uh, to Local Government Communities Committee. We now move to agenda item two, which is the committee's inquiry into homelessness. And the committee will take evidence on its inquiry into homelessness. And can we welcome Bridget Curran, the Glasgow Housing Options Steering Board, Fiona King, Campaigns and Public Affairs Manager, Shelter Scotland, Jules Oldham, Head of Policy and Operation Homeless Action Scotland, and Dr Neil Hamlet, NHS Health Scotland. Um, thank you everyone for coming along here this morning. Uh, apologies once more for the delay uh, in relation to the starting of this evidence session, but we felt we had to let that last evidence session run its course, quite a significant issue, as is, of course, our tackling of homelessness. We're delighted to have you all here. Now, I'm not sure if we get an indication of any opening remarks, but I'll give witnesses the opportunity if there's any opening remarks they, they wish to make. I see lots of nodding heads, so we'll just go from my left to right. So, uh, Bridget, do you want to start? Uh, I would, yes, thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for the invite to come along and talk to the committee. I am Bridget Kern, the Housing Options Project Manager, standing in today for Suzanne Miller, the Chair of our Housing Options Steering Board, and I think it's important to reflect the partnership that's encompassed within the Steering Board, um, uh, Glasgow Health and Social Care Partnership, Glasgow City Council, the Wheatley Group, Glasgow and West of Scotland Forum of Housing Associations, the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations, Shelter um, and Fiona here is a former member of our board so it's lovely to see her this morning again and uh, Glasgow Homeless Network. A key focus um, for our approach to homelessness prevention is tenancy sustainment. So a, a central component of our approach has been to help sustain people in their accommodation for all the reasons that that's so important. Um, the challenges facing Glasgow are well documented in terms of the scale of homelessness, the complexity of need and the city's complex housing landscape with 60 plus community based and national housing associations operating in the city. So partnership has been essential component of our um, strategy as we have sought the active involvement of RSLs, health and social work and third sector colleagues to develop and promote promote a culture of shared responsibility for vulnerable people needing housing advice and those at risk of homelessness in the city. Our model is a very practical model and we've had our recent second independent evaluation which is the the, the, the basis of our submission to the committee and that shows that our model protects the rights um, for uh, under the homelessness legislation and um, it shows very effective outcomes for customers with higher levels of need demonstrates the business case for housing options um, in Glasgow and shows its significant potential prevention savings thank you okay thank you very much Fiona King Hi, good morning. Thank you for inviting Shelter Scotland to be involved in this really timely inquiry. We're delighted the committee are taking it forward. Um, Shelter Scotland has offices across Scotland and various support projects and advice workers. And I suppose we see the impact and consequences of homelessness on a, on a daily basis. Uh, last year, we helped more than 21,000 people with facing homelessness or, or experiencing bad housing. And we had 800,000 unique visits to our online Get Advice uh, service. Um, so we, we know there's high levels of housing need and we are striving to ensure that everyone in Scotland has a safe, secure and affordable home because a home is the foundation of nearly everything else that a person can achieve and being part of a thriving um, community. So there's very high levels of housing need, which is why we launched our Far From Fix campaign um, this time last year. And we've been calling for leadership and action around homelessness. There's a lot of good work going on. There's a lot of good uh, pilots. There's lots of good people. There's lots of good projects. But we want to see it driven forward at a national level. So this inquiry is an absolutely perfect opportunity to drive forward some really challenging recommendations because there are real problems. Every 19 minutes, a household in Scotland becomes homeless, um, and there were 28,000 homeless assessments last year. So it is a, a, a big problem. And what we want to see is a sort of strategic whole system response to homelessness and the prevention of homelessness. It can't be just homelessness teams. It can't be just the third sector. It's great to see Neil here today because we need health, we need social work, we need criminal justice, we need education. We need all parts of our public sector and um, our third sector working together. We are in, in the middle of a housing crisis. In addition to the homelessness um, problem, there are um, an additional 142,000 households waiting for housing on council waiting lists. And these are all part of the problems we're facing. 
We need to see temporary accommodation tackled in a really meaningful way, both conditions, length of stay, how it's being resourced, how it's being funded, and is it working for people? Of course, I'm sure we'll talk about it, but welfare reform is um, a, an ongoing concern for, I'm sure, everyone on this, on this panel, and we need to see how we can address that more comprehensively. Really delighted the committee heard from service users in the last uh, session. Um, I think that was a really excellent but also quite challenging session and one of the things that came out of that was the real need for good housing support joined up support um, to help people move away from homelessness uh, so service users must be at the heart of all of this work in this inquiry and any recommendations going forward um, i think there's a big challenges but there's also a great opportunity for this committee and i look forward to the discussion thank you very much uh, jules Aldall. Good morning. Um, yep, thanks for inviting Homeless Action Scotland here today. Um, we are the national membership organisation for homelessness in Scotland um, in our 43rd year. Um, uh, and so we represent the, the kind of far and wide um, everyone who, who actually is working within homelessness uh, across the country. Um, in particular, we, we look forward to um, discussing further the use of bed and breakfasts and night shelters. That's something that, that's high on our, our agenda priorities, in particular now that we're, we're pleased to see the spotlight um, on rough sleeping, but we don't want um, us simply to move from people on the streets moving then into um, bed and breakfasts or, or inappropriate co accommodation. So welcome discussing that further today, um, along with many other points, but I'll, I'll kind of come back to those ones um, we come to those questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Dr Hamlet. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm here representing NHS Health Scotland, but I'm also here as a co-author of a report that I did on behalf of the directors of public health across Scotland called Restoring the Public Health Response to Homelessness. And that came out in 2015. And on the back of that, there's been quite a, a significant change in the relationship, particularly between public health, but also healthcare services and uh, homelessness and, and housing. And it can really be summarised in that a healthy, and I use the word healthy, home, and I use the word home rather than house, is an underpinning bedrock for well-being uh, right across the life course. It's important from, uh, from conception right through to the deathbed. And at each stage, the house has a very significant part to play in allowing all the other resources that lead to well-being. And it's important also in the fact that health and social care, as they come together, they talk um, about m providing care and health care at home or in a homely setting. So once again, we have that underpinning need for housing and well-being and health to come together. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you to all of our witnesses for opening statements. And we'll move straight to questions now. Uh, Graham Simpson. Thanks, convener. Um, and welcome today. Um, I'm just going to kick off with a, a, a general question, and it's for all of you. Um, but it's based on the submission from Homeless Action Scotland, um, where you make the quite bold statement, we know how to eradicate and prevent homelessness. So my question to all of you is, how? Jules. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I don't think it's, it's one answer. Um, and I, I think the, the main issue... Um, if, if we had kind of just one answer, yeah, that, that would be lovely, but that's not the case. So um, the main reason behind homelessness in Scotland is relationship breakdown. So we need to look at that and need to, to kind of look to see what we can do in prevention in relation to that. Um, but I think it's, it's looking at um, what we can do better around accommodation um, and fast accessible kind of routes to accommodation. Um, support where required for that, for that accommodation and there not being any kind of um, need to wait for that support if, if and when required. We need to be realistic around that, that somebody might need support for three, four months, then not for a year or two, but actually be able to then access it again when need be kind of later on. Um, 
we also need to take into account the the kind of mental health state of, of people um, at their most vulnerable point. Um, so allowing for, for not only support, but support that actually um, has background and knowledge on how to how to help people at, at that most vulnerable and critical point. Um, and as Fiona mentioned in, in her opening statement, part of that will also be all, all kind of areas of expertise working together. There's, it, it, it can be quite difficult for different budgets, different pots to kind of all work in collaboration when you've got somebody with maybe a range of different um, areas of need. So what we don't want to continue with is somebody going from pillar to post to pillar to post to actually get all the right areas of support because that's how budgets can work. So, so it's kind of about budgets working together and organisations working together with accommodation and support. Yeah, I'd probably echo a lot of what Jules has said, but I suppose it comes down to, I suppose maybe what you meant in, in the submission, and we'd, we'd feel the same, is there's a lot of data out there. There's been a lot of research. We know um, what help and advice would help prison leavers um, to, to avoid homelessness wherever possible. We know that care leavers need certain support mechanisms. So a lot of the work has been done. It's about taking it forward in a comprehensive, sustained, well-funded um, strategic way, but it, it, it is about a, a supply of, of good quality affordable housing in the places people want to live, and that's a long-term commitment to delivery of, of homes. That's, that's one element, but I suppose it's not just bricks and mortar. It's, and I think this came out really clearly from the session last week, it's housing support, and it's the support that meets the individual person. Ho homeless people aren't one homogenous group that all need the same thing. And I think you heard from the, the people with experienced care, how distinct their support needs are. But there's other people who need a range of support needs, money and debt advice. There's all sorts of things. But if we don't put support in, you're giving people the keys, but they're it, you know destined to fail certain groups of people. So it's, it, it is housing supply, it, it's support, but then it is also not just a money thing, it's joining up all of the different priorities and it's different parts of the public service and funded third sector working together. We, ex we have examples where different departments within the same council aren't working strategically together and have obviously got their eye on either their KPIs or their outcomes or their budgets. We don't want the housing management team to be working against the homelessness team or the housing options team or the social work team or the environmental health team. We, we really need all the different departments to work together. So they're the kind of three things that we, we know needs to happen and would help to uh, make a step forward in, in, in uh, responding to homelessness. Okay, thank you. Bridget Curran, do you want to come on that? Uh, yes, thank you. Again, I would very much support the comments of my of my colleagues here, but I'd like to talk a bit about our approach in Glasgow, which is a very practical and hands-on approach to the prevention of homelessness. So we have a comprehensive housing interview with people who either present to homelessness services or come to RSLs for housing advice. That includes... That's not just about an assessment for homelessness or um, a waiting list application. That includes a comprehensive um, financial assessment, along with a consent to share information in respect to the underpinning needs that that person may have, which prevents them finding, securing and maintaining a home. We couple that with an active referral system, so I very much take on board what both Jules and Fiona have said about some of the difficulties in joint working across uh, departments. Um, we we have active referral systems, name contacts in health, in social work, in housing benefit, the Scottish Welfare Fund and third sector organisations. We have developed a, support, a range of support services, um, which includes low level housing support, mediation services, and all of this has been supported by a, best a bespoke joint training programme for RSL staff and homelessness staff. We've trained just under 1,000 staff now in Glasgow to implement this approach and we provide on-site coaching and mentoring for eight weeks um, in all of our locations. Um, we now cover 72% of the social housing stock in the city uh, to implement that practical approach and I'd like to give maybe two practical examples of how that's been taken forward. It seems to me that 
victims of domestic abuse, for example, having to go homeless, so to speak, is something that we would want to radically improve. So the Wheatley Group has a policy whereby uh, victims of domestic abuse do not have to present as homeless. There is a separating partners policy in the Wheatley Allocation Policy that enables them to access housing without that. Um, granted, Wheatley is a big RSL. Um, it's got enormous commitment to this issue, as do many of other of our other RSL partners, and we'd like to see and propose the development of protocols across RSLs in which they could develop reciprocal arrangements. Um, my other last example I'd like to give is, um, I suppose, a contrast between um, a PRS tenant in Glasgow who'd lost his job pre-post pre-housing options and post-housing options. Um, so a private rented sector tenant in Glasgow having lost his job, would would go homeless, so to speak. With housing options, we were able to make representation to that landlord on that person's behalf to accept reduced rents, the local housing allowance, for a period, enabling that person to focus on the priority for them, which was finding another job, rather than getting caught up in housing, temporary accommodation, etc. And that was very effective. I mean, Shelter, who are one of our partners, um, that was um, they did the training for us on the private rented sector, which uh, propelled that during our um, implementation of the programme. That's very helpful. Uh, just before I take you in, Do Dr Hamlet, I should just put on the record, because you mentioned Wheatley Group. Now, sometimes I work very well with Wheatley Group, but they have just uh, consulted in changing their allocations policy under choice-based letting. Not with great engagement, I have to say, uh, certainly with myself, despite my my efforts and maybe the nature of an MSP is you get to see things when they don't quite work, you don't get to see the success stories, but I think for my constituents watching that I represent, I just have to put something on the record in relation to how choice-based letting is or isn't working in relation to Wheatley Group, but I'm very, very grateful you've put the positive things that are happening on the record, and, and that's important, but I've constituents, if I didn't say something there, would certainly uh, be on the, on the phone and emailing me about that. Dr Hamlet, sorry for my indulgence. Could you come in now, please? Thank you. Uh, on the question of eradication of homelessness, um, I, th I think I'm right in saying that Finland has made some excellent progress on that. So an examination of, of the changes that they made at policy level in Finland uh, would bear fruit. Um, when I look at the, the issue of the eradication of homelessness, I use a, a framework um, which consists of uh, five easily rememberable R's. And the first one is rafters, and that is all about the availability of housing. Um, and we know about that, you've talked about that. The second one is relationships, because we know that the greatest cause uh, of uh, people becoming homeless is a breakdown in relationships. So the creation of good relationships, and again, that starts um, you know, from the cradle. And so that brings in whole issues around uh, what we call ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. And that was one of the, the key preventative points that we raised back in that report in 2015. So, so we've got rafters, we've got relationships. Once you have both of them, you then are in a position to take advantage of resources. And those resources might be welfare benefits, they might be a good education, they might be a job, they might be um, just the network of, res of people around you that prevent you from actually experiencing homelessness. So you've got the, and I, I believe the order is important, you need the house, you need the relationship which gives you access to the resources. And after that comes um, what I call um, um, restoration. Um, or uh, recovery, because all of us need sleep, all of us need a home, which is the place where psychologically we are safe, we're comfortable, we're fed, uh, and we can relate and get on with our living. Without that, our stress levels are very high. And so the need uh, physiologically for sleep is as important as we have a physiological need for a house. That brings in the whole issue of Maslow's hierarchy of need, and it would be interesting to debate how that hierarchy of need is inverted, as we see in terms of the responses that you may well have had from some of your experts by experience that will have spoken to you um, previous weeks. 
After that comes resilience, because if you have those other four R's, <clears throat> you're then in a position to be able to bounce back from a situation which could actually land you into a homeless setting. So those five R's I would commend to you. Thank you very much. Uh, a lot to follow up on there, Mr Simpson. Indeed. Um, th thank you very much. Um, and, and, and thanks, um, by the way, for all your submissions. I enjoyed reading them. Um, uh, particularly impressed with the one uh, from uh, Glasgow Housing Options, um, where you were, you were just telling us in great detail uh, about how that operates and how the, the joint working was really impressive. Um, you've got 52 partners in the city, which is uh, extraordinary if you can get 50, well, it's gone up. Um, so if you can get all them working together, that's uh, that's brilliant. Um, I, want, I want to move on um, to discuss uh, one of the things you mentioned, uh, temporary accommodation, uh, because we've heard um, there are real issues out there, A, with the standard, and, and B, with the, the length of time that people are staying in temporary accommodation. I wonder if you've got any thoughts on that, any uh, evidence that we, we could use? Um, who's catching my... Jules Oldham, let's start with yourself again there. Thanks. OK, um, well, it's, it's a difficult one to really get the, the true statistics around temporary accommodation because often people will be in and out and back and forwards through local authorities. Um, and so, actually, I, I'm not terribly sure that the, the figure, the current figure is 10,873 um, households came forward for the, the last year um, as, uh, um, or are currently in, sorry, in temporary accommodation. But I'm not really sure that gives you the full picture in that somebody can arrive to temporary accommodation. Um, that's not entirely suitable for maybe location for them at that point or just their circumstances, other people in the building. They then return to local authority. They end up in a different uh, temporary accommodation. Um, that doesn't work for whatever reason or maybe, yeah, uh, they, they can basically go from pillar to post for on average three different places back and forwards through a local authority until they're in a temporary accommodation place that they'll, they'll be in for, for some time. Um, so to start with, yeah, just just highlighting that the figure around that's quite difficult to gauge because just depending um, if that's seen as one case or not. Um, too often now, though, um, it's actually the, the bed and breakfasts are, are being used. Um, it's about eight, nine years ago since I worked in frontline services. And at that point, I remember us saying, actually, we're going to uh, eradicate the use of bed and breakfasts. Um, and that was that was a goal. Um, and that goal seems to have kind of just just left us. Um, there's uh, I've discussed this with many local authorities in the last few weeks and, and everybody's saying, yes, we've we're needing to use bed and breakfast more, more and more. Um, and that's not, it's just simply not acceptable. Um, I realise it's something that can't be changed overnight. It, it, we need a, a long-term plan, need a, a long-term strategy there to, to actually take that um, and really, really change things. Um, but just to, just to give you the picture of, of how that works if you're in temporary accommodation in a bed and breakfast, um, you'll, you'll arrive, um, you're, you're given a room, often with many others, who, who are in the same circumstances as you in that. So it's not the very nice bed and breakfast that we would head to uh, um, on our holidays. So yeah, you're, you're, you're in a very basic room with very basic amenities and often asked to leave at eight o'clock, seven, eight o'clock every morning. You're then expected to have somewhere to go throughout that day with very little funds available to you. Um, and then only able to return there about kind of five o'clock at night at, at best. You don't have access to somewhere to, to cook, often not even a, a kettle, so uh, and not somewhere to be um, doing your own laundry. You know, all these basic fundamentals aren't there. And it's simply not acceptable that we're, that we're actually putting more and more people into the, to that type of accommodation. Um, so I think that needs a bit of a, it, it's not an overnight solution. It, it does need over, a, a focus and a, and a focus kind of nationally um, to eradicate that. Um, the other element of that that I'd like to highlight is night shelters, which are, are also on the increase in use. Um, and by those, 
Um, again, I'm going to return to when, when I was last in frontline services. At that point, a night shelter was used in the month of December um, and a, a churches would take it in turn to, to provide um, a, a floor space for people who were in need, kind of dire need at that point, to have a floor space for that night. And then they were returned the next night if, if nothing else had been provided. Um, so rewind to then, yes, it was in the month of December. Now we're looking at often October, often as far through February, March, that these are, are provided. Um, how we've got to this just, just seems incredible um, and something that we, we really need to be um, working to, to be providing support within there and, and kind of removing um, that as, as any kind of resource. It's not that somebody even has a bed as such, you know, they've really just got a roof over their heads. Yeah. Night shelters, is this yeah. just in Glasgow and Edinburgh or is it in other, no, other this is, places? This is, yeah, this is further than, than just Glasgow and Edinburgh. Yeah, obviously uh, the bigger numbers are Glasgow and Edinburgh, but no, this is across the country. Um, and certainly Glasgow in particular, we've really seen an increase in, in the use of those. So um, yeah, it, it's starting to become the norm. And that's, again, it's not, a, not an acceptable kind of solution. Uh, and strangely, alongside that, um, there's actually um, supported accommodation with some voids that weren't always there, but people are going into night shelters. So we've got something something wrong along the way there, um, where where people are actually just going to the kind of the the quick go to solution rather than us actually being able to provide something long term, permanent, and um, as Neil said, a home. Fiona King? Yeah, I think temporary accommodation is a huge issue and I'm glad um, the committee's focusing on it. I think the, the world-leading homelessness legislation we've got in place is fantastic, but the temporary accommodation is a critical, critical part of that. You can't, you can't provide everyone with a permanent home um, on, on, on day one. So temporary accommodation is critical, but in an ideal scenario, it would be a, a, a time, a short time, in suitable accommodation and an opportunity for someone to get the help, support, advice um, and whatever else they need to move away from homelessness. But unfortunately, the average um, length of time in temporary accommodation is 24 weeks. Um, it's estimated that the uh, local authorities uh, provided, just check I've got this right, um, 3.8 million days of temporary accommodation in 15, 16. So whilst there's 10,000 households at any one time, it's millions of days worth of temporary accommodation and the picture's really fragmented all over Scotland there's different types there's different responses some of it's good some of it's not quite where we'd want it to be but it's an incredibly stressful time for people to be going in and out of temporary accommodation I, I think it came out really clearly last week that people are going literally pillar to post it's bafflingly complex um, if you're at the point of crisis and you're doing two days here seven nights here sometimes you're asked to leave sometimes you can stay there for a long time sometimes your housing benefit covers it sometimes it doesn't um it's not it's not really where we'd want it it, it to be um and we know there's an increase in in the use of temporary accommodation three percent up three percent more uh, children this year than than the previous year um and so whilst it's a critical part, I think there are big problems in the temporary accommodation system. And just to, just to add a kind of human, human face to that, we've got client, a, a client uh, recently, a 16-year-old girl with a two-year-old child, who was offered a fairly um, unsatisfactory B&B or a room in a Premier Inn on the side of the motorway. 16. There's, neither of those options were appropriate for her. And I think this is an opportunity to step back and say, what do we want to achieve with temporary accommodation? What's the purpose of it? There's an incredibly large amount of money being spent on temporary accommodation across the country. And I'm not sure it's doing what we as a community, as, as, as uh, social landlords or people working in homelessness and housing would want it to do. So we need to repurpose all of that time and energy and money into providing better temporary accommodation. And we need to improve the standard. We need to decrease the time and we need to make sure the support and people aren't left floundering there. Just to pick up on the point that Jules made around um, people not having facilities to cook, linking to what Neil said, if you're, you're putting a 16-year-old with a two-year-old child in a room where they can't cook, not only are you impacting on that person's experience and the trauma they're suffering of being homeless, 
but what are you what are you saying to that two year old if they can't even cook a meal? It, I mean, it's it, it's pretty bad, and I'm not saying that's happening everywhere every time, but it's also not an unusual case. People are stuck in in in, in temporary accommodation that doesn't really um, suit suit their needs. So it is an area that needs to be really um, reflected on, and what could we do better? Take the rest of our witnesses down. Take Dr. Hamlet, and then we'll take Bridget Curran after that. I'm just conscious as well, Mr. Simpson, that. You're identifying the scale of the problem. Uh, when we make recommendations, we're quite keen to, to signpost where solutions might be as well. So just bear that. And you, know, you want to get, get the scale of the problem out there, but we're, we're quite keen to be directed towards where potential, potential solutions should be. That said, Mr Hamlet, I'm not expecting you to come up with all those solutions in your answer to this question just now, but we'll take you at this moment. Nice and simple. Um, at the root of the temporary housing issue is is the lack of social housing and so it, it's back to the rafters we do need more houses in scotland um, and then there wouldn't be this sh this shortage and this constant having to move people to and fro i think we need a change in the language because we talk about this agenda in relation to to housing terminology so you talk about terminant uh, you talk about um, temporary accommodation. For me, if we're thinking about the person who's experiencing homelessness, what they need is a restorative um, accommodation experience because they will enter uh, temporary accommodation having been through a very traumatising experience. Evidence tells us that people uh, make an HL1 application really quite late in their career of, of insecure housing. So it's a desperate move for many. And in fact, some never are prepared to even make that desperate move to, to make an HL1 application. So there, we have to realise they come highly traumatised, either from an entire life or from a recent experience. And so the first thing they need is recovery. And I think we should talk about recovery accommodation and focus it then on the person being re-empowered to then be able to step on into whatever accommodation comes down the line. Thank you. Thank you. Bridget Curran. Thank you. Um, my colleagues have all painted the picture um, that you know exists about temporary accommodation, and I think that makes the issue of tenancy sustainment all the more important. We need to do everything we can to help people sustain their existing accommodation, and as all my colleagues have pointed out, that means getting in as early as possible to support vulnerable people. So in Glasgow, we were able to do two things with our mediation service, focusing particularly on young people, but now um, available beyond young people, um, rather than young people going into temporary accommodation, and everyone knows the associated consequences, the pathway that that can therefore lead young people on for some time thereafter, uh, where it was safe to do so, we worked with young people and their families to help them return home or to make a planned move, if that was the best thing to do. We also helped them link into Jobs and Business Glasgow, because very often some of the issues around relationship breakdown were about behaviour, lifestyles that could be addressed in other kinds of ways um, and the other issue um, around that I think is about finance just people's income and we'll maybe talk about that a bit more in detail later um, but we were very fortunate as part of housing options to have slab funding which allowed us to co-locate um, money advice workers one each in each of our three community homeless teams and that was hugely we had the best return we had 18 pounds for every pound spent on that fantastic return for direct client financial gain also in debt management meaning people paid their rent they paid their gas they paid their electricity uh, regretfully we lost that money in march which was we were very sorry about uh, but that was that had a huge impact on supporting people to help them at that stage before they moved to temporary accommodation thank you jules oldham did you want to come back in on that um, yeah I, I just want to come back on on your your request for for some solutions um so yeah um we we're of the the thought that actually if there's bit of a step away just to just to clarify this is not supported housing i'm talking about it's temporary accommodation um but if there's a step away from more of the the, the sort of six six in a block type accommodation that that's op often provided if that could be more of a, a move to um a broader range of of indi individual flats individual premises um and to do that alongside yes local authorities and um 
social stock, but also um, working well with some some private landlords. Um, if if they were to get some support within that, you might find even sort of accidental landlords, you know, landlords who hadn't planned to be become landlords, would be very up for for actually being part of a, a temporary accommodation scheme with a, a bit of support in, in getting that right. Um, but in addition to that, actually looking to see the, the kind of longer term, we know that people are spending longer times in temporary accommodation. So if someone, for example, was there for a year, which is currently really not unusual, unfortunately, um, if they had a, a property um, and if they were in agreement, very much up to, to them, but if they were in agreement that actually that became their permanent tenancy and another property then became a, a kind of temporary place, um, in, in, in place of that, then that would be a, a kind of solution that, that's got a bit of fluidity to it, but it's also empowering to the person. Um, and it needn't be 12 months, you know, hopefully it would be something that would suit that person. If they were, if, if their child, for example, was about to, to start school, then having that conversation saying, well, actually, you know, we don't want you to have this upheaval three months down the line. So can, can we look at this and maybe offer this as a, as a permanent tenancy and we'll, we'll open up a, a temporary let elsewhere. Um, so I think there, there's definitely solutions there, but really stemming from more individual premises rather than us putting everybody who don't have support needs always, or, or not to a great extent, um, into kind of blocks of, of kind of places. And the kind of overarching bit of that that also needs to work is this needs to happen where in a way that people can stay in employment, which currently isn't the case. Um, it's, it currently is often just out of the question to take up employment because of cost or to actually continue with your employment because of cost. So we, we need to take that into account as well. Okay, did you want to come in there? Just in terms of um, things we could do fairly immediately, we'd like to see um, temporary accommodation standards to be statutory rather than voluntary. It's something that we've been calling for for quite some time. And I, I just feel that statutory footing would um, focus resources in a slightly different way as <laughs> new laws tend to do and also would give our frontline workers an op you know, a, a statutory footing to take forward challenges because at the moment um, we're not a always able to legally challenge accommodation which is uh, unsuitable there's the unsuitable accommodation order but that is um, a strong piece of legislation but it's a pretty low bar we, we, we want to move away and, and move into something a little bit more aspirational the other thing would be ensuring people aren't left um, in temporary accommodation with no uh, no communication with no information no support so if they have to be there for a length of time which at the moment with the housing shortage is the case let's try and make that time as beneficial as possible. Don't leave people with no clue what's happening because that only compounds all of the problems and the issues that they have. Okay, thank you. Liam Simpson. Happy for other members to come in. Okay, Jenny Goldruth to be followed by Kenny Gibson. <coughs> thank you, convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, Neil Hamlet, in your submission, you, you talk about the, the multiple needs of homeless people in terms of uh, you know, an overlap between drugs, alcohol, mental health, different things that might have affected them. Um, Fiona King, in her opening statement, alluded to the experience of care experienced young people. And, and I know that you know last week we, we heard from a number of care experienced young people. I wonder what the rest of the panel's views are then in terms of the specific needs of care experienced young people with regard to homelessness. I nearly called you Margaret Curran there, I do apologise. Bridget Curran. Not at all. Um, in Glasgow, there's been a lot of work done between the RSLs and the former council and the Glasgow Health and Social Care Partnership on developing a protocol and a statement of best practice to um, meet the housing needs of young people leaving care. I mean, the Wheatley Group has got, a, has got a strong record in that, as have a number of the RSLs. And that's proven to be, I think, with the comments that colleagues have made about the right support, um, help and links for college and for employment, that's been very successful and the tenancy sustainment levels for those tenancies are 92 93 percent uh, higher higher than normal waiting list tenancy sustainment so i think that proves that with the energy and the commitment there is a substantial amount that can be done to support young people yeah, I to on that. Um, dr hamlet I'm delighted at the ordering of the questions because we've moved from rafters to relationships and, and, and uh, I firmly believe that's the right way to go about it. What we're talking about here is 
what are the transition points when people can fall into a state of homelessness? And, and you cite a very important one, which is leaving care. And I try and summarise um, those critical transition points where people can fall into homelessness. And those are the points where surely we need to provide safety nets and springboards to help people not fall or if they do come up quick. Um, I use the terms leaving and losing because there is either a loss or a leaving in almost every form um, of homelessness. It may be, as you say, loss of a home or leaving an institution uh, and so on and so forth. There's a, there's a whole range of them. And I think that's a useful way to approach the whole concept because if we can identify the transition points, then we can start looking at preventative approaches. Um, and I think when you when you work your way back through co the causation, the chain of causality, you get back to the importance of adverse childhood experiences, mm -hmm. of which many are experienced by those uh, in children in care. Yeah, thank you. If you want to um, I think it, it is, as Neil says, identifying those transition points, but we do know what they are. Care leavers are um, overrepresented. It's not a huge number, but they're overrepresented in homelessness figures, as are prison leavers and that's this comes to the very heart of prevention we know they're going to be leaving the institution it doesn't come as a surprise to anyone um that's exactly where we should be focusing resource because it's um apart from being horrendous for the individual it's much more expensive to let them fall and then keep picking them up and keep picking them up go go preemptive go Try and tackle that, get in there, take a homeless application, or ideally don't take a homeless application, provide the housing and support that people need uh, before going round um, the homelessness route. So I think um, I think the, the people last week um, could, did it a lot more justice than I'd be able to, the experience and also the things they feel they needed. But I think it is identifying, which we've already done, those critical points and front-loading the services, trying to, trying to get in there much, 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 much earlier. I think all of the focus is still too much on the point of crisis. Even the housing options approach, which we are uh, 100% supportive of and have been involved with that is when someone's identified a housing need we need to wind back the clock a wee bit to try and identify where the cracks start showing and not wait till people get into crisis uh, Bridget Hull. Could I just add um, to that point, I think Fiona's point is absolutely um, so well made to get in um, early intervention and that's where I think the contribution of housing associations, speaking from a Glasgow perspective, is absolutely critical because housing associations, housing officers in the main, they've got their own patch, they know who their tenants are, they know where there are issues and difficulties. Um, part of the difficulty for them in Glasgow before housing options had been knowing who to contact if you anticipated a problem and then how to secure that support and assistance, how to go up the chain, how to escalate, and joint work with Housing Options has made a huge impact on building those relationships for the long term that don't wave a magic wand and sort out very complicated problems, <coughs> but do find a pathway through them. Okay. Yes. Follow up to that then. Um, I appreciate what you're saying, Bridget Kern, and obviously you opened by talking about the mediation that you offer in Glasgow. But with regard to getting to the housing associations before they get there in terms of preventing even getting to the housing associations, what we were hearing last week is that there are certain government reforms that are being brought in by the UK government that are making people's life more difficult. So universal credit rollout, benefit cap, cuts to housing benefit, all the things that were coming out from our witnesses last week that are making their lives far more difficult and that's before they get to the housing association um, and we've obviously had the statistics out from the national audit office across england and wales showing a 60 percent increase in the homeless uh, population so there are things that are happening to the homeless population before they arrive at your door uh, and in terms of mitigating the effects of that a note in the shelter submission you say it's unlikely that the scottish government will be able to sustainably mitigate all of these changes um, do the rest of the panel agree with that statement People have to get better making eye contact with me here. Fiona King, <laughs> right? Go for it. I mean, I think I think that we, we have um, grave concerns about the rollout of, of, of the rural welfare reforms, the rollout of universal credit. It's in our submission. We are involved in lots of the working groups. We submitted to the Social Security Bill recently as part of the Scour group. Um, we've met with the minister last week to to discuss some of the specific things that Shelter would like to see in the new Social Security Bill. I think you're right. It's it's um, creating an even more complicated and at times 
detrimental landscape for people. It's, it's getting harder to navigate, um, and we believe that some of the welfare reforms are pushing people further into poverty. One of the particular groups who are being impacted on disproportionately is young people. And um, without going into all of the detail of the very complicated <laughs> welfare reforms um, that we're seeing, but if people are unable to afford to move into a permanent let, that that throws a real spanner in the, in the um, whole delivery of the homelessness system. And I think that that is a real problem that we're seeing. I think the problem with mitigating uh, and I think there's some really positive steps forward. I think um, trying to mitigate the removal of housing benefit for 18 to 21s is, is a great positive step forward. Mitigating the bedroom tax is, a, is really positive. But that's a long-term expensive commitment. And um, there's, you know, we're, we're seeing the problems piling up one on top of the other. And I suppose it's how, how long we're able to do that. Uh, no, take Jules Oldham, uh, then Dr Hamlet. I'll let you back in later. Bridget Kern, Jules. Um, just on, on the note of universal credit, um, we, we know that arrears are, are one of the, the biggest areas of concern. Um, having spoken to a number of local authorities on this um, and, and how their, their teams are dealing with things, it does seem that there's um, a bit of a disjoint with um, homelessness teams and eviction teams. In, not not everywhere, but, but certainly enough enough of the local authorities across the country to be a concern to us. Um, so we would certainly recommend that actually that's something that that is ruled out across the country, that, that actually there there is that need for eviction teams and homeless teams to be working really closely together. And as a part of that, to actually look at the, the current protocols and when, when the eviction is actually starting to, to progress. Um, we know that it's very likely that there will be at least six weeks arrears, but actually, for, from the, the stats so far, that could even be sort of 12, 14 weeks, etc. So um, why not now actually be looking at, at the protocols across the country and, and just just dealing with that really at the, the core prevention case rather than us, us dealing with a, a whole lot of stress for, for somebody receiving the, the paperwork they're about to be evicted, etc. when it's something that's really out with their own control. Um, and we could do that right now as Universal Credit's actually rolling out before it goes kind of far and wide um, and, and kind of do a bit of prevention work there. Dr Hamlet? We seem to have moved seamlessly from relationships to resources. Um, and I think it is it is a big, big issue because we face a bit of a perfect storm in terms of some of the impacts of welfare reform, and we're seeing evidence of that. So the question is, what can we do about it? Um, and I certainly think there are promising um, collaborations appearing. For example, um, I've been in quite a number of events where DWP have been coming along and explaining what kind of exceptions they can make for those who find themselves in a homeless setting, which perhaps frontline workers were unaware of. So certainly in Fife, we've been able to get some very useful discussions at a local level between DWP, um, the uh, folks that work within the prison service, these through care support workers that you'll have heard about. Um, when these people all get together, then you start to find ways to help, for example, the prisoner um, coming out through the gate and then finding he's got no money for a fortnight. Um, so, you know, these kind of things are, uh, there are there are promising pieces of work um, and I, I think it would be good to encourage them. And if you haven't had evidence from DWP, it might be um, something worth doing. That's very helpful, Dr Hamlet. Bridget Curran. I, I just wanted to make a, a comment in terms of mitigation about the importance of financial advice for people. Um, but agencies are very worried about the impact of universal credit and welfare reform, and I think people are increasingly worried themselves about how they are going to manage. And I've said earlier about the, the access to slab funding, um, which was used by like, more than half of um, the um, users were tenants of RA cells, some of whom had their own money advice services, because I think it's sometimes people in debt find it very difficult to approach people and tell them the truth about what their situation is. Um, and for 
more information. One of our team members, one of our housing options uh, team, has been seconded to Development and Regeneration Services in Glasgow City Council to develop a housing options response to benefit cap for people in the private rented sector. And we're beginning to look at some of the very interesting work that's, that's emerging from that. Jenny Gorris. Thank you. OK, thank you. Kenny Gibson. Thanks very much, convener. I mean, uh, uh, that was a point I was going to touch on in terms of, you know, uh, you know, the, the the importance of financial advice. He said uh, earlier on that for every pound that was being put in, there was an eighteen pound benefit, and yet he also said that the, the Scottish Legal Aid Board funding was cut from March. What was the reason behind the decision for that that, that being cut, uh, given the the obvious um, benefits to your client base? We were delighted to have had the funding for the period we had. My, two years, yeah. uh, my understanding is that the mm. money was uh, redirected elsewhere in Scotland um, because SLA, that's my understanding of it because SLAB certainly, um, I think, would have been happy to continue to have funded our work. Um, and we would love to get that funding back if that were possible. Yeah, so you're obviously looking for it. How much money are we actually talking about? Anyway? It was £203,000. And yeah, for £203,000, we had had £2.2 .2 million in direct client gain. Uh -huh. We had £1.45 million in debt management. And it was the twin side of that that meant it was about um, income maximisation, but also debt management. And in our experience, debt management is becoming a critical issue for people. And in our previous conversation about um, welfare reform, there are huge concerns about the impact that will have on families and family incomes. Yes, I see 1,643 clients were assisted by that, actually, yes. so that's mm -hmm. obviously a concern that's been taken mm -hmm. away. Now, all the, all the submissions are, are really excellent, and today, just this morning, we obviously got housing options uh, uh, evaluation 2016, so I don't think all members have had an opportunity mm -hmm. to absorb all of it, but I have to say, from what I've been able to pick up from it, it is a fascinating uh, document. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you, you, you obviously point out is, somewhat modestly, you say the implementation of housing options in Glasgow coincides although you, you're not claiming direct responsibility, <laughs> with a steep decline in homelessness assessments, um, which are down from 8,299 to 5,829 over three years. And you talk about how in Glasgow the continued decline exceeds the Scottish rate, uh, and there's a strong evidence that a rights-based approach is a key principle of model operation. Uh, and I mean, it all looks very positive t to myself, but um, when I looked at the other, the other papers, um, um, Homeless Action said that with regard to the option, um, with regard to the options approach, um, uh, there's definite areas of improvement, and you do touch on that in some of it in your, uh, towards the end of your own paper, and I'll ask uh, uh, colleagues about that in a minute. But Shelter, who um, Fiona King just a minute ago said that Shelter are 100% support of housing options, but in page 11 of your submission, you, uh, um, or page 11 of the submission we've got, um, it says, we share the concerns raised across the sector that housing options is sometimes being misused to essentially gatekeep homeless service, services and resources. Housing options may not be used as a ration, rationing tool for housing. So I'm just wanting to, to try and square the circle and try and find out what, what people are actually thinking about the housing, housing options model. What are the, 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 how it works successfully? But again, what the, what the kind of um, drawbacks of the model are, and I, I just and just final point before I, I let Bridget Curran, because I know you're desperate to obviously uh, answer. You, you do say on on page seven of the of the evaluation that uh, despite positivity, staff don't feel confident delivering tailored advice and every housing option given poor availability of quality housing system intelligence, etc. So I wonder if you can kick off with your successes and perhaps uh, areas where you feel further improvements can be made, and then we'll go on to what Jules Oldham. And if you're not King thinking of Mr. Uh, uh, Dr. Hamlet, is any comments Mr. as well? Gibson, if, because Fiona King was much more subtly bursting to get in as well when <laughs> you were mentioning that. If, if, if that's a technical expression. Yeah. That he was bursting <laughs> to get in. But because Bridget Curran might be able to respond to some okay. of the concerns that Fiona King might sure. raise, so mm -hmm. it might just be good to do it that way. So, Fiona King. Great, yeah. Um, so, Shelter Scotland is 100% behind the housing options model when applied correctly and I think that is the key thing we've published um, I think two housing options uh, investigations and, and reports which I'll happily forward to the committee I was on the steering board in Glasgow for a time and I think the idea that you look at someone in a holistic way and you look at their um, financial situation their needs their requirements their housing experience their financial situation and consider all of their options and then give them the advice and support and guidance to make a choice that suits them 
there's, you can't argue with that as a model. It's much more um, sort of mature, holistic way of, of trying to match a house or a home with, with a person. But I think um, the undercurrent is that we're, we're essentially trying to ration a pretty scarce resource. And I think um, it, everyone on this panel will be aware that the Scottish Housing Regulator published a report on housing options, and it was they also identified some pretty substantial um, uh, queries about housing options and, and its application. It's applied differently across all 32 local authorities. The statistics and the impacts are quite different across all 32 local authorities. Um, there's um, different, different models, different ways it's being approached. And I think um, the issue of um, people being denied access to services is a really important one and one that we at Shelter Scotland are looking into in more detail. It's difficult to quantify if, if someone's being uh, turned away from services, but we do have anecdotal evidence from our frontline staff that in some places, on some occasions, people aren't being able to make a homeless application, which is uh, is a problem. And so statistically, it's, it's unclear how big a problem that is, but by offering someone a housing options service and looking at um, all of the different things that um, may impact on their housing solution, we don't want to see people being denied the right to make a homeless application because that is a statutory right that people have, as is temporary accommodation, and housing options doesn't trump that. It should be part of that mix. And I think the model that um, was being designed in Glasgow when I was a part of it absolutely understood that and that housing options and homelessness are two halves of the same coin it's when housing options um or if housing options is um being used in a way that doesn't allow someone to make a homeless application if they wish to that's where there's a problem but it's it that is a difficult thing to to kind of quantify um and we're doing a bit more work on that Mr Gibson, did you mention that Jules Oldham might have something to add? Yes, she did. I'm only quoting from her own paper, actually, where she's saying there's definite room for improvement, so I just want to, uh, you to expand a wee bit on that. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, the ethos, brilliant. We're, we're absolutely um, behind that. Um, but there is, there's a lot of um, need for a housing options worker to have a, a wealth of knowledge and therefore a wealth of tra trainings needed. We, we know that the um, toolkit was started um, to, to come together some five years ago, but is yet to come to fruition. So um, meantime, you've got quite a few kind of bits and pieces of training happening all over the country. But um, if, if I was to be a housing options um, worker, I would find that that's, that's quite a, a tricky place to be in and have that, that vast array of knowledge that, that's required to be able to give people really tailored um, support. So I think, I think we, we, we're hoping to see a bit of, bit of momentum on the, the toolkit itself, but also not see that that's going to answer everything with that training. Um, I think there's there's also a bit of a need now for it to, to move out with the local authorities themselves. Um, so if, if you ask many third sector organisations about housing options, it's still not known. And that feels like a bit of a missed trick as far as I'm concerned. This is by now we should really see third or, uh, sector organisations and local authorities knowing kind of how to work really well together to, to kind of be able to provide the the broadest range of possibilities for someone um we we sat in on, on a number of different assessments in different local authorities just to get a feel for what what was happening and, and who was doing what in what ways um, and we saw great work taking place but there was often a bit of repetition in what was being offered within local authorities now of course you've got the kind of um only, only so many options available within one area, but it was kind of felt that that was almost um, kind of restrained because somebody didn't quite have that that knowledge as well. So, for example, does someone have enough knowledge to help where somebody has, um, I don't know, a, a mental health issue and being able to pick up on that? I mean, that that's quite a skill set that we're, we're asking for there. So there, there needs to be significant kind of input on training, etc., around that or at least be able to get the right direction if somebody's in, in need of help with their mortgage arrears. Uh, so, you know, these are these are really quite diverse topics and, and to have quite the right skill set to do that 
it's taking a lot and we, we need to, to get a bit of momentum on the training, but also be bringing in the third sector wherever possible to kind of really be upping the, the skills kind of um, back and back and forwards there. So after all that, Bridget Sorry. Kern will let you know. I, I know you're not speaking about housing. Well, sorry, Dr. Hamlet, I didn't um, <coughs> my apology. People who are, who are approaching housing options have obviously got a degree of housing insecurity. And that brings up the issue of the interplay between uh, physical ill health and mental ill health and, and housing insecurity. And so we need to bring together, and I think we're beginning to do that, um, the, the importance of, of how secure housing for the well-being of the individual. And so they may well be turning up with headaches, with psychological issues to general practice, and the solution lies in housing. And so being able to get bi-directional referrals from housing options, not just homelessness application officers, but from housing options to health, and from health to housing options, is one of those upstream preventative approaches. Uh, now, how we make that happen, in, it would be lovely if it was written into uh, the new evolving arrangements around primary care, primary care contracts, if such were possible. Um, we, uh, within the public health sphere, are trying to make inroads into attendance at these housing uh, hubs that you may have heard about, um, whereby councils in groupings of about five or six meet together. And I think there is a, a very valid contribution that public health can bring to the debates that they would have. Thank you. And now, finally, Bridget Kerner, I'm conscious you, you can only speak about housing options from Glasgow experience, Absolutely. but there's a lot in that, so any information you can give us would be really helpful. Yes. Well, thank you so much for that question, um, or for that, for that series of questions. Um, um, and I'd like just to f start off by talking about Neil's final point about the West of Scotland, about the hubs, the West of Scotland hub has been c critically important to us in the development of our thinking because you're with partner uh, local authorities. Wheatley is the only RSL that's in any of the hubs. It's a place of really good argument and discussion and we would love to have you come along, Neil, to the West of Scotland hub, so I'll organise that invitation for you. But to get back to the reduction in homelessness, um, we do believe that our housing options approach has made a significant contribution to that, but we would not sorry, we would not take away from the commitment and work of so many other people that are involved in trying to address homelessness in Glasgow and doing lots and lots of good work. But uh, our contribution, we think, has been um, very strong. Um, the issue around gatekeeping, um, our steering board actively sought the contribution from Shelter and from GHN to have third sector representation on the board right from the very start to ensure that the critique that Fiona has highlighted was part of our thinking from day one. And we knew that gatekeeping was a very legitimate concern. We knew from the experience in England that some of the huge um, uh, reductions in homelessness that had happened there, there might have been some concern that gatekeeping was happened. We wanted to make sure it did not happen in Glasgow and our second independent evaluation comprehensively demonstrates that it doesn't. There are higher homeless applications in Glasgow than in um, Scotland and people who approach home um, housing options for homeless advice, 20% of them do, 24% consider a homeless application and 26% absolutely make a homeless application. So we are very um, confident that gatekeeping is not an issue for us. Um, in Glasgow, we don't have housing stock, so we don't have a housing service. And I think and my understanding is that in other local authority areas, um, housing options is delivered through the housing service, and it's got a fo it's got a focus on homelessness prevention uh, and dealing with homeless applications. For us in Glasgow, we have had to work with RSLs, so we have had to develop our tenancy sustainment element of that, and we have had to talk with housing colleagues about what makes it difficult for you to keep people in their accommodation and that's when they told us it's joint work with health it's joint work with social work it's housing benefit it's the scottish welfare fund so we have invested heavily in developing proactive partnerships in which there is a raft to use neil's phrase again of colleagues in health and social work in the north east of glasgow the northwest of glasgow the south of glasgow actively working not alongside housing options workers but working alongside 
uh, uh, colleagues, the community homeless teams, and working alongside colleagues in RSLs to support people. And the fact that we have a steering board that has continued to meet for the five years of the development of the housing options approach demonstrates the commitment from the Glasgow Health and Social Care Partnership. Homelessness is a key priority in its strategic plan. The commitment from the West of Scotland Forum, the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations, Shelter and GHN to ensure that our approach is robust and meets people's needs. Um, the point about staff, I'm so glad you raised the, I mean we want to do a lot more about encouraging staff to be more confident in the range of options that are available and we've got lots of work to continue to do that. Um, but we have, I mean there's one situation I always think about, this is a couple who lived in the east end of Glasgow who lived in a third floor tenement flat, adequately housed, had gone to the local housing association um, and would have been told adequately housed, you know, really not much we can do. But with the housing options approach, the housing officer in the housing association did a financial assessment, looked at other options, and that couple are now living in a shared equity, front and back door, house of their dreams. So there's lots of opportunities to develop lots more options. I think Fiona King might want to come back on some of that. After yeah. uh, Fiona, if you like, aye. Yeah, sure. Just really briefly to say, I think it's really encouraging to hear Bridget talking about the, the model and how it's developing in Glasgow. I think the interplay between the statutory duties and the housing options approach it is it is quite complicated and it's quite um, varied in, in different um, local authority areas. But the absolutely critical point is that for some people, there won't be any other options than making a housing uh, homeless and ap homelessness application. The private rented sector, rent deposit guarantee schemes, family mediation, uh, uh, transfer, whatever, all of these different things um, may not be an option for some people. And by that, I mean the people with the most complex and, and the multiple exclusion homeless who, who don't have uh, those as an option. And so it is critical that those people are helped and facilitated and enabled to make a homelessness application without delay. I think prevention is the key to addressing homelessness. But when someone is clearly homeless and needs that assistance, that is why the legislation is in place and that is absolutely the right thing to happen and temporary accommodation is absolutely the right thing for them. So it's not to confuse the two. For some people, there are no other options. Okay, thanks. No, it's just to say, obviously, I think everyone would agree prevention is obviously better than cure. Uh, in terms of training, I know, uh, again, in the evaluation report, it says that, and I quote, the longer the housing options and models delivered, the more competent staff become with its delivery, and I'm sure we, we, uh, that, that, that we'll see further progress. But I was just going to ask, um, you know, uh, 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 if you want to talk about different uh, models uh, of approach across Scotland, and I'm just wondering if there is a, uh, I think the housing hubs thing seems to be a great idea for exchanging best practice, but is there a, 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 a kind of best model or does it have to be something that is adapted to local circumstances and is there a consensus on the way forward in terms of where housing options fits in with uh, the, in addressing homelessness specifically or, or, or is, there no, is there not yet a consensus on where that model fits in in terms of the entire homelessness uh, um, picture that we have in Scotland? Um, I think Every housing options service really needs to be tailored to the local area. Every local authority has got a different interplay with housing associations, different geography, different people, different you know client group, different uh, job market, everything. So the 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 um, when housing options model when it was introduced by the Scottish government was deliberately. Um, left to local authorities to develop their own models and the hubs were supposed to facilitate that and that joint working. There is a lot of um, best practice sharing. There's been a lot of conferences and events and, and papers and evaluations. So I think that's the best way forward is to is to continue to share that best practice. I think the regulator have got a role to play in, in checking that, okay, the models might be different, but are the consist is there some consistency in terms of a, a, a sort of minimum standard and uh, outcomes I think for individuals but I think what's going to apply in Glasgow with the 69 60, uh, 60, 67 <laughs> housing associations and what have you is going to be different in Murray or or um, up in the islands or in Fife or wherever so um, I think I understand why no there wasn't a consistent rollout of one approach because it just wouldn't apply in every circumstance but um, I think toolkits and Scottish Government monitoring and evaluation has got a real role to play to ensure that it's not um, anything goes. I think wanted to come in. 
Mm -hmm. um, I hope the committee is aware of the data linkage work um, that is being done currently by the National Records of Scotland. It's reference five in, in, in our submission from Health Scotland. But that will be ready shortly, and that will give us 15 years' worth of data in relation to HL1 data and health outcomes. And I believe they've also managed to source the, uh, it'll now be a couple of years worth of prevent one data, which obviously um, is the database that's looking at the, the housing options um, approach. So that could give you a very early picture of what is certainly the different outcome from the perspective of healthcare needs um, with the arrival of, of the housing options approach. Um, and again, it might be worth seeking evidence if it's ready in time um, while you're meeting. The other thing I would want to draw your attention to is I think, and I'm speaking here as a, as a doctor, not a housing expert, but I think the, the whole thinking around housing support um, is based on what was it, 17 areas from the supporting people um, period. And we've moved on a long way and we now think much more uh, out of our boxes and I would like to suggest a review of what you consider as housing support could maybe be a bit more holistic and might be worth review. Okay, thank you. Bridget Kern. Um, could I just um, um, bring to the Attentions Committee the significance of the Housing Options Toolkit that's being developed? Um, that's been progressed by North Lanarkshire Council on behalf of the West of Scotland Hub across all the hubs. Every single Scottish local authority has signed up to that. Um, it's about to go into procurement. It should be operational from April next year, and that includes a wide range of tasks within that, so it extends into the areas we've talked about, not just housing advice, but health and wellbeing, um, and the Ruth Rafter resources relationships scenario that Neil was talking about earlier, and that, I think, will be very helpful in ensuring not uniformity, um, because I don't think uniformity is the answer to anything, but consistency and high quality to good customer focused advice for people in housing need. And so forgive me one last thing. This is just Fiona's point about complex and multiple needs. I would like to again bring to the committee's attention that in our evaluation we asked the team to look at whether our model met the needs of those with complex multiple needs. Um, and the um, and we had one to one interviews with a range of um, service users supported by the third sector organisations and the, the the answer back was that it wasn't um, for many of them, their immediate focus is on survival um, and on all the associated uh, consequences of um, the problems that they face. Um, so, I just want to support that. Okay. Now, I don't give a time check to, to witnesses. I know we were delayed, but I want, I want to get the maximum amount of time for, for giving evidence. We'll probably have 10, maybe 15 minutes tops um, to allow this to run its course. So, hopefully, we'll get some more questions in. And I'm keen for you all to put your views in the public record, but if it I don't mean duplicates. If it reinforces what someone else is saying, just let us know that you agree with that, and that'll, that'll let us kind of move forward as, as, as effectively as possible. Uh, Alexander Stewart. Uh, thank you, convener. Thank you, panel. Can I look at the sort of housing first proposals? Now, there has been some very positive feedback, uh, and there's been some discussion about how that is working. Uh, I know that NHS have had have looked at two local authorities and, and that specific re response. Uh, but I'd like to get a sort of role and a view uh, from you all as to how you think it plays in, in supporting uh, the response to homelessness in Scotland uh, and, and how beneficial the, the, the concept is so far. The time to put on the record that the committee is going to Finland next week um, to take quite a substantial amount of evidence from all the stakeholder groups in relation to to housing first and wider uh, housing and homelessness policy as well. We're very conscious that other than New York, Finland's the only other area that's upscaled this in any significant sense and we want to get a real feel for it as a committee. So you will also help inform us ahead of our, our trip next week. So I just wanted to put that on the record. Uh, Jules Oldham. Um, yeah, we, we wholly back the, the importance of housing first. Um, and in fact, I think we were one of the first organisations to bring it over here, not not actually put it out there, but um, work with Turning Point for it to come about. Um, and we've done a few evaluations of local authorities um, who have um, embarked upon housing first. So absolutely, we are totally behind it. 
Um, but I think what's important to know is that Housing First is for a very small number of people. Um, and to really make it work is, is to really work and focus on the people who absolutely will, will kind of um, meet the model. Um, our concern is that if it was to go kind of, well, we'd like to see it far and wide across the country, but were it to, to go too far to, to those who didn't meet the, the model requirements that becomes diluted and doesn't quite have the, the kind of effect that, that it really should have. So um, we, would, we would kind of say absolutely all for it, but kind of go with, with caution to kind of, to, to ensure that it really benefits those who, who it's there to benefit for. We've already seen um, a few local authorities mentioning that they're, they're embarking upon Housing First who actually aren't. Um, and they're doing maybe a homes first type scenario. And actually, when you delve into that a bit further, what's really happening there is somebody's, uh, is that a local authority is um, really carrying out the legislation well. So somebody's getting a tenancy when a tenancy is available and support's being provided. That's not housing first. It's really good practice, and we want to see that as well. But it's, it, yeah, so it, it's kind of the points of it not being diluted. It really being there for those who it will absolutely benefit and for there to be good practice happening, yes, but let's not call that housing first. Okay. I'm trying to be brief. I broadly agree with everything Jules has said, um, but just to, just to say that it, the, the outcomes are fantastic for housing first on, on the very small scales that it's been delivered and the pilots have been carried out, but it requires kind of choice and flexibility in both housing provision and support that we just do not have in abundance at the moment. It, I mean, the session last week, if, if committee took anything, I would hope it's that there's a, a desperate need for better housing support. Housing first to get the outcomes that you would seek to replicate from the models and the pilots, it's, it's a ton, untime limited 24 hour support effectively. We're, we're struggling to, su to supply basic housing support. So I think it's aspirationally fantastic. And I think for the client groups who it, it really works for, it's, it's a great thing. Should someone get a house at the point that they are in a housing crisis? Absolutely. It's not, it's not rocket science. If someone doesn't have a house, should they get a house? Yes. Um, if we could do that, if we had all of these houses to allocate at the, at the point someone walks into their local authority in a housing crisis, we would do that. So I think there's a real resource question, but the model is one that we support and we'd like to see rollout, but not, not comprehensive rollout. It's part of the solution. It's not the panacea to homelessness in Scotland. And then Bridget Conn. The evidence base is absolutely rock solid. Um, the European evidence in particular, because we're, it's closer than North American experience. Obviously, we're building the evidence base in Scotland, um, but that that we do have is very positive. England already has a network um, of those uh, working around the housing first, um, and so I, I, we really have to do it. It's the resourcing thereof which is the challenge, and adherence to fidelity um, of the of the model. First, it has operated in Glasgow and the Glasgow Health and Social um, Care Partnership are actively involved in developing the model further um, and are working with third sector colleagues through the CAN initiative and with GHA and with Big Society Capital. That, that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. Alexander Stewart, do you want to come back? In convener, it's, it's, it's quite evident that it's a piece of the jigsaw uh, in, in the, the the dilemmas that we face in tackling homelessness, uh, but it's it's only a piece in the jigsaw. And as you rightly indicate, if you don't have the the financial re resource to follow up, the support mechanism to follow up, uh, then then it is only going to capture a small number of individuals, and it's not going to change uh, the, the dimension. And as you rightly indicate, last week we did hear some harrowing evidence uh, from people who found that the support mechanism wasn't in place for them in the supported accommodation. So. If we agree that it's, it's certainly something we should all be signing up to, uh, but it's how much emphasis we should give to it. 
to ensure that it doesn't then become something that everyone's trying to achieve uh, uh, and, and not managing to achieve, or as you rightly say, because of the, if they're following normal practice and procedure, you would get the normal uh, housing support, uh, and, and it, it, if everything's working, uh, then you, you, you will succeed. But as I say, my, my concern is that there may be too much emphasis on it going forward by some individuals and local authorities about what it's going to achieve for them in a short term. Uh, and, and, and I think you've, you've indicated that probably is where you see it falling. If it's going to fall uh, in some way, it will not be successful for, for achieving everything it should. I don't think there's a question wrapped, wrapped, wrapped up in that, but Fiona King, did you want to come in? And Neil's right, it's fidelity to the model. If you want the outcomes of the pilots and projects we've seen, you have to be absolutely stick rigidly to that model. And so any, any dilution of that is not housing first. It's mm. correctly applying the homelessness legislation we have and giving someone a house and support as quickly and, uh, and correctly as you can. I think the committee will want to tease out uh, how, how Finland has hopefully avoided some of those pitfalls mm. in, 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 in relation to its upscaling of, of the system. Now, if there's any additional information or questions you would ask if you were us in relation to Housing First in, in, in a finished context, then please drop us an email to, to the committee clerking team. Not a not a big written submission, just what you know. Any, any just comments and observations because we want to just make sure we've, our knowledge base is as strong as it possibly can be. But before we head out there, Jules Oldham, did you want to add anything? Um, just to say that having done a, a few evaluations, um, I'd certainly want to check with the local authorities that we've done the evaluations with that that was OK to share. But if they're fine with that, then we'll we'll share those evaluations with you. Yeah. That, okay. that would be very helpful. Bridget Curran, yeah. On the same theme, there's been an evaluation of the Turning Point uh, scheme mm. in Glasgow, and I similarly will check out if that can be made available. If you got it. Okay, and it's been whispered in my ear that we're, we're, we're taking evidence from Turning Point on the 25th of October. So, But it would be good to have any information you, you can ahead of uh, the, the committee visit. Okay, well, is it okay to move on from that section, Mr Stewart? Okay, Elaine Smith. Oh, thanks, convener. Um, I was listening earlier to Jules Oldham's comment about a few years ago we were supposed to be moving away from B&B accommodation. Well, actually, I was a homeless officer 30 years ago and we were supposed to be moving away then from B&B accommodation. But one of the ways of doing it then was um, in building decent, if you like, homeless units which weren't, which actually had sort of contained flats within them in the area that I worked and people could um, feed, you know, they had kitchen use, etc. So that was one of the ways of trying not to use B&B accommodation. Um, so it's a shame we haven't, I don't seem to have moved that much forward in that that time. Can I turn to rough sleeping? Um, because as shelters say, it's the tip of the iceberg and we do know there are so many other different um, homelessness situations and reasons for homelessness um, going on. But rough sleeping is quite visible, obviously, and they're becoming more so as well. So I want to just explore, explore that a wee bit more. Um, and specifically, I think when the, the homelessness legislation was passed and it took away the need for a priority need assessment, a homelessness assessment, I thought at that point that that would help with the whole rough sleeping situation because it would mean that anyone would be entitled to be put in temporary accommodation of some kind, basically given shelter, I suppose, as, as the way we, would, we could put it. However, that, that doesn't seem to have what, and I think part of it is this gatekeeping issue where people turn up, they're told there's nothing, they then have to go and get a lawyer's letter to take back to the housing provider, the local authority, to try and get action. So that's one thing that I would put there on the gatekeeping issue. Can I ask, though, is it appropriate that it's Christian organisations predominantly in our big cities and possibly elsewhere that are providing this night shelter type of accommodation? So you get Bethany... Christian Trust in Edinburgh who are using different church halls every night, as I understand. And then you've got the night shelter, the um, Glasgow City Mission in Glasgow, providing the night shelter accommodation, which has gone from one month to, to more than that. So that's in your cities. I know in some towns, um, for example, in Coat Bridge, it was church halls that were being opened to give people overnight accommodation. So how, whilst um, clearly I don't think... We would want a long-term option that, that people were in um, hostel-type accommodation. Is that an answer? What is? I'm asking what is the answer? And I know that Jules Oldham had mentioned in the submission that um, there's hostel-type accommodation available that wasn't being used. 
So do we need more of that type of accommodation? Jules Oldham. Well, I think we do still have the situation where people, as, as you've said, are, are turning up to local authorities and being told there is, there's nothing. So we, we need to, to look at that. Um, but we also need to look at the, the case where, where people are turning up and they're, they're maybe offered that accommodation that, that you're speaking of and they're, they're saying, actually, I'd rather be on the street. So we've got a type of accommodation, the hostel style or... It's, it's, more, yeah, it's, it's, more, it's more likely to be um, yeah, where, where there are other people. So, yeah, it could be a night shelter or it could be a, a temporary accommodation. It could also be a supported um, place. But it, it's somewhere where if you're feeling at your most vulnerable, you're not wanting to be in any building with many other people who are, who are really feeling that too, who may have kind of what at that time may, may feel like much many more needs than you or if you're um, somebody that's trying to steer clear from your addiction um, and you know that you're going to go into a place where there's other people with addictions, it might feel like the safer option to say, actually, no, that, that's what I've been offered, but that's not, not what I'm taking up. And, and that's why we were saying that actually moving away, um, in particular on the temporary side of things, moving away from these kind of larger accommodation units. I know, I know we've moved away on the whole from like the 30 bed hostels, but actually when it comes to temporary accommodation of any type, um, it does seem to be better. I'm not talking supported housing here, but when it's temporary accommodation for those to be kind of individual kind of properties. But convener, could I ask a specific question yeah. about that? It seems to me then that what has replaced the 30 bed type hostels yeah. is Bethany Christian Church, church halls and sleeping bags and the in Glasgow City Mission with halls and sleeping bags. So is that a better option? And if you were to take away those options, you know, if you were to say, or if these organisations were to no longer provide that shelter, because that's what they're providing, what, what would be the result of that? And, and so this is where I find it difficult. I don't think that um, going back to the Peter McCann house style yeah. is, is, a, is a brilliant idea. But at the same time, what has replaced it? Christian well, charity is giving out sleeping bags and, and basically a shelter. I agree. It's completely wrong. That's that's why we ask for there to be a kind of long term focus on on kind of working towards us not having that. I don't think I could say this winter we shouldn't have that because there needs to be the resources and time to put in to actually be able to provide that the correct accommodation. But somehow we do have we have gotten to the point that there are bed spaces available yet people that are going to the, to the um, churches. How that has come about that that is the I, I don't know okay. actually on the, on that front. Um, but yeah, I, them, them being um, led by any religious organisation, I don't think that's the issue. To be honest, it, it's more the fact that we're we're kind of ghettoing people in in any type of accommodation, in particular in the winter months. If I could just clarify, convener, I don't think I meant that being led by religious organisations was the issue, but that's who's leading it in the big cities and actually some of the towns, um, or charitable organisations, if you want to put it that way. They're yeah. stepping into a breach, it seems to me, that, you know, I would personally think that it should be the state that should be providing, but then that, what I'm asking you is, does that then take us back to the days of the, and I'm using the example of Peter McCann, house in Glasgow, does that take us back to those days and is that a backward step? Well, and, and that's what, what I'm saying. I think the answer to that is that we, we need to have a, a long-term focus. There needs to be kind of nationwide push to actually be coming up with a, a range of different temporary accommodation in types and styles across cities um, for this winter, as not to say kind of we'll close the night shelters, but hopefully come next winter we've got somewhere within that plan so that people aren't needing to, to go that there. And certainly the, the winter after that, definitely not, you know. But I think it needs to be a cross country focus to with a real strategy behind it to, to kind of be moving us to to no longer need those um Church halls. There will be some other witnesses who want to come in and, and give their thoughts on this. Fiona King, then Dr. Hamlet. 
I think we, it, it really is the tip of the iceberg. It's difficult to count and it's difficult to quantify. We know there's a 10% increase in rough sleeping, but that's literally the people who make a homeless application and are asked if they slept rough the night before. It's not. It's a very narrow definition. I think anecdotally, most people would agree that rough sleeping or visible forms of rough sleeping seem to be going up, although that's unquantifiable. It's, it's incredibly hard to... Um, to really understand fully the different forms of rough sleeping but it's also the most complicated area there's there's lots of reasons why people may or may not engage with services and some of them might be individual reasons I'm, I'm sure Neil would know a lot more about this but if you if you're coming with a, a range of, of, of trauma and complex needs you may have had negative experiences before you may have mistrust of the institutions you're you're hoping to engage with but then we heard from one of the service users last week that he did approach the council repeatedly and was told there was nothing for him, so he slept rough. And I think it's worth reflecting on that. That's that's the reality, is he was turned away. He was sleeping in the waiting room and then turned away repeatedly. And it was only when a legal agency got involved and, and um, advocated on his behalf. So some of it's, some of it's housing, some of it's um, poor practice on front line, and some of it's people stuff, which is the really hard thing to to uh, to disentangle some of it is uh the, the the baggage that people come with and their complex needs um but it could definitely be helped if more temporary accommodation was made readily available on a da daily basis it wouldn't solve the rough sleeping issue um but it would it would definitely help if that if that temporary accommodation was made more readily available people who've um taking a lot of courage to go to the local authority to make an application, if they're turned away, that could be the one time they choose to engage with services and then they're lost. And th and that's where you, you get into cycles of repeat homelessness and long-term rough sleeping. Uh, Dr Hamlet. I'm delighted that you've had uh, evidence already from those, uh, I, I call them experts by experience. And I think one of the uh, trends that I've seen over the last two, three years is an increased expertise of these experts by experience, um, particularly some work that's done by Pathways in London, um, such that um, folk who've been through the experience are, are right up for being able to talk about their experience and provide very solid evidence-based advice as to what they see as the best way forward. Um, and I, I commend you for doing that, and hopefully you'll, you'll you'll have more of that kind of you know folks experts by experience answering that very question, which which is best. Thanks, Thank you, Dr. Hamlet. Uh, Bridget Kern. From a housing options perspective, as I've said previously, in terms of multiple and complex needs, um, there's not a huge response that, that we provide directly. However, we're very pleased to see um, that the First Minister's announcement about the newly established group, chaired by John Sparks and uh, Suzanne Miller from the Glasgow Health and Social Care Partnership, will be representing GHSCP on that. And I think that's a really good opportunity to look at the complexity of the issues and the potential solutions and ways forward. Now, um, apologies, Deputy Convener, but we, we probably have, have, have to move on. I'm conscious we did have a number of questions about the recent Scottish Government announcements in relation to homelessness, uh, which we, unless Mr Whiteman was going to ask that, was that your line of questioning? No. No. If there's any observations you want to make on the recent Scottish Government announcement, feel free to do that now. Briefly would be good because we're almost out of time, but then that allows us to mop that up and not have to ask that question separately. So, Bridget Curran, you've been very helpful that you've, you, you've said something. Any other comments from any other witnesses? You don't have to have a comment. If really, you're really pleased with the announcement. We're pleased to be part of that action group and we'll work with all partners, but we, we do have a solid evidence base. I think we, we, we're excited about taking forward things. Uh, uh, short life action group is, is kind of what we want to see, some action. Okay, point well made. Any other no need for it, Mr. Uh, Dr. Sorry, Dr. Hamlet, I apologise. Very briefly, but again, it comes from the, the same programme from government. Um, <clears throat> at the start, I said we need to re-engage um, public health with housing. That's that's where uh, we began as, as a... As a as a specialism and I think the opportunity to have a new public health body in Scotland we need to not miss the opportunity for housing expertise being part and parcel of that so that we can prevent uh, homelessness as upstream as possible. Okay thank you. Jules Oldman, do you want to add? 
Um, no, I think I think really we would say the, the exact same as Shelter on that. Looking forward to be part of the board um, of the, the group and, yeah, delighted with what's been said so far. Okay. And I'm breaking all my own rules by letting you back in, Bridget Curran, but on you go. Because I hadn't realised, because I would have said this earlier, uh, we are, we are um, delighted about the First Minister's um, um, announcement and in particular about the wide range in review and the review of the legislative framework because we would like the opportunity to again say that we would like people to have a statutory right to a housing options um, um, service. It's important you put that on the yes. record, thank you. So our final line of questioning uh, th this afternoon now, time's getting on, is Andy Whiteman, MSP. Uh, thanks, convener. I'm conscious of time, so I've got a lot I want to talk about, but I'll just restrict it really to one thing, I suppose. Um, uh, in a number of your evidence, you talk about a rights-based approach to housing which certainly in the context of human rights becoming more and more important in public policy is very welcome. Um, but I just wonder if you want to reflect on the evidence, for example, we heard last week from um, Thomas Lyon, um, who has had a litany of very, very tragic circumstances, all as a consequence of the fact that 10 years ago uh, he was evicted because his landlord went bankrupt. Now, given that the private rented sector has tripled since 1999, um, and given that I've got constituents in Edinburgh who are being driven out of the private rented sector because of they can't afford the rent, um, and they're now incurring far higher costs than they would um, uh, because of the obligation of the council to pick all that up. I'm just wondering if some of these rights are rights that we need to challenge in respect of property ownership, because we have over 30,000 empty homes, and yet we're spending billions building new ones. Um, and landlords still, even under the new Private Tenancies Act, have the right to evict somebody if they want to sell the property. And as a consequence, trigger a whole series of events, which hopefully won't be as tragic as Mr Lyons, but in many, many cases may well be. Um, do we need to revisit the idea that someone who is in secure accommodation in the private rented sector should be able to be evicted because their landlord wants to sell it, whether it's a, the owner or the creditor? Any comments on that? Um, Bridget Curran? Well, that's a situation that we come across uh, sometimes in terms of housing options because people will come for housing advice because their landlord either sometimes has to sell the property because they're not making the mortgage payments. So there's a whole host of issues around that. Um, and uh, we give them good quality housing options advice. But in terms of the private rented sector, we think there's several things that can be done to improve that. And this was an area of discussion that we had at the um, in Glasgow. Um, with the uh, Integrated Joint Boards subgroup on housing, health and social work, uh, where there is private sector representation. And they talked about um, the accredited landlord scheme that's in operation and the opportunities to work with accredited landlords who would not behave in that kind of way with tenants. Um, and that's something that we want to take forward. Um, we also want, clearly there's issues about affordability in terms of rent charges and their willingness to take accept tenants and benefit um, and their appetite to work with community homeless teams to offer longer term tenancies um, to with their willingness to agree in adaptations and the use of key safes and their own knowledge within the private rented sector of how they can access support to support tenancies who are in difficulties alongside maintaining and ensure the safety of uh, their properties. Then, Dr. Mm -hmm. Pretty huge questions there about um, the private rented sector, but uh, I really apologise if you could answer those. Yeah, hugely, I mean, I suppose the questions most critically, minutes. the new how the new um, private rented sector uh, legislation coming in towards the end of this year will um, put tenants on a much firmer rights-based footing. So you'd still be able to evict if you want to sell your home, and I think that's that blocking that uh, would be problematic but you there's there's a restricted list of um, reasons why you can uh, evict your tenant you have to have a specific reason so move uh, taking out that uh, carte blanche to evict anyone was a huge step forward and does put the private rent sector in um, Scotland on, on a much uh, tenants on a much surer footing than any other part of the UK so that is really positive I think it's uh, getting information to tenants uh, very difficult group uh, private tenants there's there's no tenant groups they're not you know um, not a homogenous group we've got a private rented sector panel where we're trying to get the views of, of private rented sector tenants and, and feed in but it is getting advice and information out to um, all private rented tenants and those particularly at the risk of, of losing their home affordability is a huge issue there's the option of rent pressure zones um, in the 
latest bit of legislation, which as far as I know, no council has taken forward. So it'll be interesting to see if any councils decide to activate that right to introduce rent pressure zones. But the problems in the private rented sector are uh, numerous and some of the solutions are forthcoming, but we need better landlord registration. We need better enforcement of landlord registration. Um, so there's a, there's a few positive steps going on and I think the, the new legislation will certainly help. But um, I suppose the, the example of Thomas Lyon who you brought up, that was a, a, a terrible set of circumstances initiated by that action which was no through no fault of his own um but the, the issues on the private rental sector aside i don't think the response he got from anyone he engaged with was what it should be and, the, and that's probably the bit that's most within the scope of this inquiry is why was one incident why did that spark 10 years worth of chaos and i think that that that's the really pressing issue for the inquiry um thank you for that Dr. Hamlet. I strongly support the, the the notion in your question that a housing rights approach should underpin, sorry, a, a human rights <laughs> approach should underpin housing policy. Um, and I, I see that from multiple angles, not least some of the, the uh, work that came out for those with no recourse to public funds and in relation to the human rights approach. So I do think the human rights approach is, is the way forward. Um, and I would also refer you to um, one of the later chapters, I can't remember which one, in the Commission on Housing and Wellbeing that came out, uh, a blueprint for Scotland, Scotland's future in 2015, because there they raised a very interesting discussion around housing in Scotland and, and the, the, the rights versus the economics thereof. And I, I think that would be a very useful discussion. Thank you. And Bridget Cumb. Oh, no, that, I said my point, sorry. Oh, sorry, is it Jules? I, I do. It's been a very long morning for the cafe. <laughs> I do apologise. Um, just briefly, I, I was in Dundee yesterday and saw something really interesting where they were, um, they've got a scheme... In fact, I think it's working with Shelter too, but Dundee, certainly Dundee City Council are working on a one-to-one -one basis, um, so a, a timely um, project, but um, with landlords to actually help ensure that they can get um, all the paperwork right, any issues with 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 any tenants kind of that they they foresee, they can actually be be discussing those and kind of looking at how to prevent any of those. And it, it seemed like such a simple solution that actually having a, a lot more projects in place to be working just w with landlords themselves to see um, how how things could be pre prevented. And one of the cases that were actually that was. Um, discussed yesterday a landlord um, actually even reduced the rent to be in line with somebody's affordability um, just to be able to to avoid getting somebody else in and, and kind of you know they they have a tenant that they trust they're very happy with etc and and who would have thought that 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 can happen but the right communication and them knowing that they've got good support from the the council there actually has has enabled some really positive results so i think there's something we can learn from that actually it's quite a useful project okay and it, just mr. very mr. brief follow up i mean i'm not suggesting briefly mr whiteman i apologize that i'm having to be, be like this because you waited to the end but time is almost upon us so really briefly Yes, just in response to Fiona King, I'm not suggesting that all those grounds for eviction be removed. I'm just questioning the grounds number one and two, which are the grounds to repossess on the basis of a, a sale by an owner or a creditor, a situation which is virtually unprecedented anywhere else in Europe, mm -hmm. and how that appears to be, certainly in Thomas's case, that triggered the whole event. And as we move forward with the growth in this sector, um, I envisage it becoming more and more of a problem. So is it Shelter's view that those grounds should, should remain or should be removed? Currently, we worked with the legislation and we were happy with the grounds because they do represent a significant step forward from from what was what was removed. Um, I, I'd need to come back to you, I think, and the committee on on changes, fundamental changes to um, private rented sector policy because it, it's not something I've got okay. to hand. And it may or may not be something the committee decides to take forward an interest in. It's slightly, it's important, but it's at the fringes of some of the stuff we've, we've been looking at. It's certainly important to our, mm -hmm. uh, the, the evidence we heard that we heard last week. Uh, apologies, Mr. Whiteman, for curtailing your line of questioning there. Um, thank you, everyone, for taking the time this morning. First of all, apologies once more for the delay. Hopefully, you found the lines of questioning rewarding for yourselves. It's certainly informative for us as we take forward our inquiry. So. Uh, 
we will stay in contact with you, keep, keep you posted in relation to how our inquiry unfolds. But we'll now move to agenda item three. Thank you. Uh, so moving to agenda item three, which is subordinate legislation, the committee will consider negative instrument 284 is listed on the agenda. The instrument is laid under the negative procedure, which means that its provision will come into force unless the parliament votes on a motion to annul the instrument. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee considered this instrument at its meeting on the 19th of September 2017 and determined it did not need to draw the attention of the parliament on any grounds within its remit. I can inform members that no motion to now has been laid and can invite members whether they've got any comments to make on the instrument before us uh, this afternoon. There being no comments, uh, can I invite the committee to agree that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument? Are we agreed? Indeed. Okay, thank you very much. And we now move to agenda item four, consideration of evidence, which is previously agreed that we'll take in private. So now we move into private session.